Welcome, everyone, to the Virginia Society of Enrolled Agents, part three of tax law changes related to the coronavirus pandemic. I want to remind everyone, if you have any audio or video problems at any point, then you need to refresh your browser. Once you do that, you may have to click on Allow audio and it should pop in. Obviously, you need to make sure that your speakers are also turned on and enabled as well. In addition to that, today's webinar does give you credit for two continuing ed or IRS CE units as well as two NASPA CPE units. IRS CE will be provided by the Virginia Society of Enrolled Agents. NASPA CPE today is sponsored by CryptoTaxAcademy.com. And so those will come from different places. Just be aware of that. Uh, but if you happen to need both, then you may end up getting two different certificates. And that is because two different organizations are issuing the IRS and the NASPA CPE in this particular case. So don't be surprised by that. If you have any problems along the way with your IRS CE, then you would contact the Virginia Society of Enrolled Agents. If you have any problems with the NASPA CPE, you can reach out to me or to CryptoTaxAcademy.com. Uh, and we will get you taken care of there. So hope that everyone is doing well today. Welcome back. I do want to remind you that each hour is a 50-minute hour by both IRS and NASBA standards, which means that you must be present today for at least 100 minutes on the webinar. And that's from the time that, that we actually kind of started. So that means that you're going to need to be present with us through at least 350. So make sure, hey, Dwayne, good to see you, bud. So make sure that you are with us until at least 3.50, and we will uh, make sure that you get your credit, assuming that you also answer the polling questions. There will be 10 polling questions today, and so make sure that you answer at least eight of the polling questions in order to get full credit. If you do not answer all of the polling questions, you will not get full credit. So be aware of that. And if you are not present for at least 100 minutes, you will not answer or you will not get all of the credit either. Vaughn, if you would let people know in the chat kind of how to fix their audio. Looks like a couple of people are just joining and, and having some issues there. Uh, and might need some help there as well. So hopefully everything will go well. I will say that if you have trouble with the polls at any point, uh, you can miss two of them and it'd be okay. So that's the first thing to be aware of. But the second thing is you can always let us know in the Q&A, that's a little more private, let us know in the Q&A or by chat if you are unable to answer a poll so that we will have a record that you were present and attempted. If we have no record that you were present and attempted, you're not going to get credit. So just be aware of that. Uh, and with that housekeeping, Vaughn, I am going to turn it over to you. That sounds good. Appreciate it, Knox. Before we get rolling into the rest of this, we did want to share with everybody that we'll, the Virginia Society of Enrolled Agents will be offering a spring seminar virtually. That is June 3rd, 4th, and 5th. It's going to have 12 hours of CPE. If you're a member, it's 200. If you're a non-member, that's 250. And uh, the next slide is going to share just a few things on what we're going to be covering. Notice of deficiency, Schedule D and publicly traded partnerships. That's day one. We're going to hit partnerships and S-Corps on Thursday, June the 4th, as well as reporting rental real estate advanced tax issues. And then on Friday, we're going to do what to do when a client passes away. And also, show me the money, the ethics of fees. That'll be through Friday. And this is just a list of the featured speakers. Uh, unfortunately, you won't have to worry about Knox and me that day. We have some excellent speakers uh, lined up for that. Uh, we will also put a plug in. We do plan to do under, under the Virginia uh, Enrolled Agent Group some future webinars, which will give you kind of a sneak preview of that on a little of the collection stuff in this presentation today. So now you have the link there at vasea.org backslash tax seminars. That is the registration registration link, excuse me, for the virtual spring seminar, June 3rd through 5th. And just as a, an addition there, a couple of people were asking, where can I find the videos for part one or part two? So those replays, those recordings are not going to offer CE or CPE. So let me say that right off the bat. You do have to attend with us live in order to get the CE or CPE. But those videos and handouts are available at this same link at visa.org slash tax dash seminars. You can reach those as well. So hope that you will check that out. Uh, and that that will be helpful to you. The other thing is to share with you 
that the Education Committee for the Virginia Society of Enrolled Agents has made a decision to open up the member price to all affiliates of the National Association of Enrolled Agents. And so if you are a an affiliate of any state with the National Association of Enrolled Agents, then you will qualify for the member price, which saves you 50 bucks. So quite a quite a deal there. Also want to share with everyone, this is copyrighted material today. Uh, this is copyrighted by Vaughn and myself, respectively, depending on the portion. So don't steal our stuff. That's the short uh, part of that. I have no problem. Vaughn has no problem with you using this material in your own practice to help yourself. But don't go publish it online and use it in your own presentation or something like that. Uh, Vaughn, with that, you want to introduce yourself? Sure. So just a little bit about my background. My specialty as an enrolled agent is in IRS collections. Uh, although I never worked at the IRS, I trained with a former IRS revenue officer. He and I worked in a partnership practice for almost eight years and worked every case together. So we, we averaged anywhere from 100 to 150 collection cases a year uh, off the top of my head. And so this is all we've done for years. So I'm going to be handling the collection side. I also generally chat about a few other things. We had planned to dig deeper into the PPP forgiveness. We will be mentioning some of that. But as of, I just checked a few minutes ago, uh, SBA.gov has not published their uh, payroll protection program forgiveness guidance. We've been looking for that all week. So we will be sharing recommendations, opinions, educated guesses on that today, but we will not be formally reviewing any of the SBA.gov forgiveness section because they just haven't published it yet. So we're all waiting for that. All right. And and most of you probably know me at this point, but uh, my areas of expertise particularly are the taxation of clergy, cryptocurrency, cannabis, foreign earned income, anything on the fiduciary return, the 1041 S Corps Trust. And I do a little bit of resolution. I don't, I don't do as much as Vaughn does. And I'm actually heavy on the exam side where he is heavy on the collection side. I do probably 30 collection cases a year. So that's a big difference from his 150. Uh, and I do about 40 exams a year. Uh, and, and that's enough for me with the rest of what I do. So but I am a fellow of the National Tax Practice Institute. I most recently served as the chief tax officer for a company called Happy Tax. And across all of the brands there, I am no longer with Happy Tax, uh, but I, I did do that for a while. Now I'm just in my own practice. So I thought this was going to be a nice, easy going tax season. That was my plan. Uh, when everyone asked, hey, what are you doing next? I said, you know, I'm just going to serve my clients. It's going to be a nice, easy going season. And it has turned out to be anything but. But anyhow, uh, this is a season unlike any of us have ever experienced. That's for sure. So what are we going to talk about today? We're going to talk about Notice 2020-20, uh, which we've talked about before, but I just want to review it because it's important. And then we're going to talk about 2020-23 briefly. But then I want to talk a little bit about tax court uh, and give you my perspective on some things there and, and some things that you may or may not be aware of in terms of deadlines. We're going to talk briefly about PTIN fees. We're going to get to pay those this upcoming year. Aren't you excited? And then Vaughn's going to walk us through uh, some updates on collections during the pandemic and, and particularly updates since we last spoke. So what has changed and what are some, there's even some new forms out. We'll talk about that or he will anyway. And then he's also going to talk to us about the CAF unit and, and what's happening there or, or more accurately, what's not happening there. So he'll talk to us about that. Then we're going to do a review of the Families First Coronavirus Response Act, particularly uh, three sections, but two sections specifically, and that's the Emergency Paid Sick Leave Act and the Emergency Family and Medical Leave Expansion Act. We'll also talk about the credits that are related to that, how we deal with those, and Form 7200, which relates to that as well. And then we'll look at notices 2020-21 and 2020-22 in that context. We're also going to take a look at some documentation guidance that has come out from the Department of Labor. Uh, one of the questions that many of us had the last time we talked about this is what kind of documentation are we going to need to provide in order to substantiate these particular provisions? And so we're going to talk some about that, the guidance that has come out related to that. We'll spend a little bit of time on that today. We're not going to talk about any of the individual provisions in the CARES Act. Uh, we are going to talk about some of the business provisions. Now, I will tell you that your slides include some information on the individual side, including unemployment. We're not talking about that today, but I included it in your slides just because many people have the questions. We're going to talk briefly about the payroll protection program, some clarifications that we have garnered over the last week or so. 
And then we're going to take a deep dive into the employee retention credit. We're going to spend a good bit of time here today on the employee retention credit, because I'm not sure that we have really had a webinar where we have taken a deep dive into this by us or, or really anybody else that's done a great job on that yet. So I want to take a deep dive there today. And then we're going to really briefly look at net operating losses. I will tell you that we're going to be very brief on that. And I'll give a little plug for an outside organization, but Kathy Morgan, who I think is, is with us as an attendee today, is going to do a two-hour course specific on these NOLs. Uh, coming up. And so reach out to her if you're interested in that. And that'll be through Tax Practice Pro. So uh, if you're interested in that, she's going to take a deep dive into that. I'm not going to go very deep today. I'm just going to touch on it. And it's simply, I just don't have the time. So, but she's going to do a great job on that. And, and those are reasonably priced webinars. So briefly looking at notice 2020-18, this is the one that superseded 17, expanded on the relief and define the affected taxpayer pretty broadly as any person with an income tax payment or an income tax return due on April the 15th. That person, of course, is identified within the code, and that is an individual, a trust, an estate, a partnership, an association, a company, or a corporation. And it extended the due date for filing and payments for anything that was due on April 15th to July 15th. There were some holes here, though, and we're going to talk about that here briefly. Uh, on the positive side, it removed the limitations of 17, and it included the estimated income tax payments that were due on April 15th. So that was obviously quarter one. So that moved quarter one to July 15, but it didn't do something else, which we'll talk about in a minute. And it explicitly excluded information returns. But on the positive side, it did move interest penalties in addition to tax with respect to these to July 16th or after the July 15 updated deadline. We don't have to file a 4868 or a 7004 on these. The extension is automatic. But with notice 2020-18, quarter two estimated tax payments were not touched, which means that we had quarter two payments due in June and we had quarter one due in July, which was kind of weird. And several of us said, well, that's odd. This gets fixed in a later notice, which we'll talk about uh, in just a moment. And uh, as we just mentioned, quarter one is now due July 15th. The other thing to be aware of is that those that were due normally March 15th, this year, March 16th, because March 15th was a Sunday, so we're talking about these pass-through entities, the 1120S, the 1065, those related forms, uh, even the 3528. So, you know, several of those forms that were due on March 15th were not impacted. This only dealt with our April 15th. So, and this notice came out after March 15th or after March 16th. So you just need to be aware that those were not moved. And, and if you have a situation where you haven't filed those, you need to get those done pretty quickly because those are now late. Fiscal year taxpayers with returns that are due on April 15th were included or are included. However, our nonprofit returns and fiscal and other uh, taxpayers that were due on May 15th were not included because it was specific to the date of April 15th. Now, we're going to fix that in a later notice. So we'll talk about that. Also, payroll and excise taxes are not included. By the way, 941s are due today. Hello. So if you haven't done that, uh, don't lose sight of that. And there was no change to the deadline for those who were outside of the U.S., which several of us thought was, was kind of weird, too. The other thing is that estate and gift tax returns were not included in 2020-18, which, which we thought was kind of weird. Now, this gets fixed, as I alluded to there. So extensions, it did specify that we can file the 4868 to 7004 all the way up until July 15, but it's going to extend till October 15. So you can't take six months after July 15. It's going to be extending through six months after the original date. And then the payment, uh, if needed to be rescheduled, I left that information there, but for the most part, that's been handled now, unless you have a fiscal year taxpayer that you need to deal with that on. So the other thing, of course, is that some states followed suit and some did not. So this is a webinar sponsored by the Virginia Society of Enrolled Agents. The Virginia has not moved to July 15, for example. Uh, most states have. There's only three or four that have not. Virginia, we are lucky enough to be in the category. Uh, we're June 1 now, but, but that's kind of what has happened there. 
So you can get that information there. The other thing is that the related contributions, whether that's on an IRA or an HSA, Archer, MSA, those sorts of things, those contributions can now be made up until July 15, the ones that would have been due with the return on April the 15th. It, th this 2020-18 did not extend an RSED. We'll talk more about that in a minute. Uh, or, I'm sorry, refund statute. I should not always use abbreviations. Not everyone knows those. Okay, so 2020-20 updated 18. And in this case, we added the, the gift tax. And so this adds the 709, which, you know, typically we do with, I don't know about you, but I do several of these every year. And we typically do these with the 1040 in most cases. So this is our gift tax return or our generation skipping transfer tax return. Those are now also due on 715. So that is good news. Then 2023 amplified the prior notices and extends to nearly every filing and payment from April 1 through July 14. But be aware, 941s are still due and so are those payments. So those are not extended. There was some confusion about 990s because the notice itself mentioned certain 990 series, but not others. For example, it mentioned the 990T, but not the 990 itself. But these are included. Uh, we got further clarification on that, and these can be filed up until July 15. This does also include the international schedules and the information returns. So things like the 8938 that get filed with the 1040, we had some confusion after the original, hey, is that going to be included or not? And, and I was one who said, unless it explicitly tells me it's included, especially when it says information returns are not included and the 8938 is considered an information return, there is no tax associated with that. I was saying we better go ahead and get those filed or get a 4868 or 7004 filed. So now we have clarification from 2020-23 that these are extended as well. And that is fantastic news all the way around. And 2020-23 extends the RSET. So that was significant as well. And this also extended the deadline in exams and appeals for 30 days. So kind of interesting there that that happened in this notice as well. And for uh, last time, we had just over 100 persons that were participants in the annual filing season program. And for all of you, if you're in that category, the deadline has been extended to July 15. We're going to go ahead and launch our first polling question of the day. And so uh, the first polling question of the day is super, super simple. Not hard for anyone to answer. We just ask, what credentials do you hold? And you want to select all that apply. So if you're a CPA, a CFP, EA, attorney, none of the above, but AFSP uh, or none of the above, select all that apply. And then you want to submit that poll. And we will give you just a moment to do that. And Vaughn, do we have any Q&A that's come in that we need to address? You are muted, by the way. All right. Um, just more, I think, FYI, someone's asking if we're going to discuss EIDL advances and, and PPP and whether it is taxable or not. Um, so how about I just answer that real quick? Take it right now, yep. <laughs> so the, well, let me answer this in two ways. They're two different questions. Mm -hmm. So I'll start with a PPP because this has been what people have been the most confused about, perhaps. The PPP is a loan. So when you take out a loan and you charge expenses using funds that came from a loan, typically those expenses are tax deductible. That's the typical way that that works, right? So if I take out a loan and I play, pay payroll out of that loan, in a typical sense, that is going to be tax deductible. But there's something kind of unique about the payroll protection program or the PPP loans in that the CARES Act explicitly says that at least a portion will be forgiven. And typically, when we have canceled debt, that is also taxable. However, <laughs> the CARES Act explicitly says that those forgiven amounts will not be taxable. So there's that piece. Now, there is another section of the Internal Revenue Code which tells us that if we 
utilize funds that are canceled within the same year that we utilize those funds. If we utilize debt to pay expenses and that debt is forgiven within that same year, then we cannot claim those expenses as expenses or deductions, okay? So we have a couple of different things that are happening with the PPP piece. First of all, if it is forgiven within the same year, which it should be in most cases, because it must be forgiven within 60 days of the end of the, uh, well, of requesting the forgiveness, which should happen at the end of the eight-week period, basically. So that should happen. And in that scenario, you are going to see a situation where, in my opinion, you cannot claim as expenses anything that was forgiven. So be aware of that. You're not going to get the tax benefit of anything that was forgiven. Okay? Now, on the other side, you're not going to get taxed for the forgiveness piece. I think the bigger questions are how does this impact basis? And that's beyond the scope of today's webinar. And it's a different answer if we're talking about a partnership and an S-Corp, in my opinion. Um, and I am really hopeful that we're going to get some guidance that, that clarifies some of this because I think 90% of our tax professionals and 90% of our taxpayers are going to mess this up, in my opinion. How many people have the knowledge even of what I just said, much less how to deal with basis? And so I think... We need guidance or people are going to mess this one up big time. So let me just say that from the outset. But but there's some, some thoughts related to the PPP. EIDL, another mm -hmm. matter. Mm -hmm. So the economic injury disaster loan is an actual loan, and the great bulk of that is not forgiven. And so anytime you take a loan, those expenses are charged against that loan. You do get to take those deductions. So for the period that is not in that up to 10 grand grant, the period that is not in that sort of forgiven piece, that's going to be fully deductible. Nothing abnormal about that. It's any other loan. It just happens to be at 2.75% for nonprofits or 3.75% for the rest of us, right? So then the only question becomes, what about that forgiveness piece? Uh, and in that case, I'm going to give you the exact same discussion I just gave you on the PPP. So hopefully I have made mud for you, um, but there are some thoughts out of that and to say that I'm hoping that we're going to see some future guidance. We're going to go ahead and close down this poll. I've definitely left it open long enough. Interestingly enough, today, 26% uh, of us are CPAs, 57% of us EAs, and then uh, a few of us in another category. So before we wrap up, kind of interesting there. Two follow-up things. Number one, uh, just a reminder for everybody, if you're putting questions into the chat, we're not trying to follow that. It's just way too hard. And I know a lot of you are answering each other's questions in there. So Knox, I'm gonna give you one follow-up and then I'm gonna take one because there's a couple, there, there's some comments already about, they've heard other presentations that people, uh, the presenters have implied, you get to deduct the expense and get the loan forgiven. Do you want to comment on that one more time? Because I know people are teaching that, but I think you and I both disagree with that. Yeah, I think you just specified that. Yeah. I mean, I hope that's clear. I know there's a people teaching it, but that is not a declared item in any guidance. That is people assuming quite a bit and inferring things. And historically, the IRS has not done that. So I, I would be shocked. I'm not recommending any of my clients follow that advice um, for what it's worth. The second part was I saw a comment uh, about the collection. So we'll be hitting that just a second. Let me, let me hit on this real quick. There was a question about deferring payments. And the, the answer that someone said, well, sure, you can defer it, uh, and then it's gotta be caught up. I, again, I have not heard that from IRS collections. I've talked to revenue officers who are still working high dollar cases. There has been nothing that I have seen or have been told that if you defer an installment agreement payment, you have to catch them all up at one time. We're gonna, there's a document in uh, the, the, the large handout, it is page 214, which will be talking a little bit about suspending payments. There's nothing in there about at, later on catching all of them up. So I just, please be careful about what advice we're sharing. Let's follow what has been stated and how we're inferring things. Because right now, to give you a little preview, the collection part coming, the IRS internally is saying, we have no idea. The system is just way too old to just suspend or cancel payments and start things right back up. Collection-wise, this will be one of the biggest messes we run into in a long time. So just wanted to throw that out. Please keep throwing your questions in the Q&A and I'm gonna kick it back to Knox. 
All right, so we are going to go ahead and, and launch back into our material, of which we have plenty today. So I want to talk a little bit about tax court deadlines. So we got a notice uh, that came out and gave us an extension of time, same notice we were just talking about, on filing petitions with the tax court. And I've given you the, the relevant regs here, but basically for filing petitions or filing a claim for credit or bringing suit upon a claim for a refund, these were extended between April 1 and July 15. However, there is a case, there's some case law that's going to help us here, that's going to help us even prior to April 1. So I wanted to bring this up, and I put that case on your slide for you. It's a 2016 case. This is a full tax court case, which means it sets precedence, and we can definitely use this. So this case, let's talk about the fact pattern. Well, in this scenario, the tax court was closed due to weather. It was a snowstorm in this particular case. And there was no existing rule regarding the days when the clerk's office were closed. And so they borrowed from the federal rules of civil procedure, and they decided to treat the filing as timely if it is received on the next day after closure. Now, the tax court is closed right now. The clerk's office is closed, and so you cannot go file something. So that means that if you file something on the next day after closure, we can utilize this case between March 19th, when the clerk's office began to be closed, and March 31st, which was before the notice kicked in. So what I'm telling you is, even though the notice specified April 1st to July 15th, this tax court case is going to extend that back to March 19th. Now, I haven't seen a lot of people talking about this. Um, in fact, I haven't seen it in any webinar that I've attended. Doesn't mean it hadn't been anywhere. But I think this is significant if you have a client who is, has missed deadlines here. Uh, so, so just be aware of that, and, and I wanted to throw that out there and, and make sure that that was in your material. Uh, and there is a new FAQ on the IRS website that, that talks some about this as well. So this is not like this is pie in the sky knocks, okay? So be aware of that. All right, let's talk about Peton fees. Uh, and you, most of us are aware there was an outcome of court case that's gone kind of back and forth over the last few years. But the bottom line is, once again, fees are going to be charged. And so the IRS has, has proposed to reduce those fees to $21 on the IRS side and $14.95 on the outside vendor. I gave you the proposed reg number there. Basically, it's going to cost us 36 bucks uh, for this upcoming season in all likelihood. And Vaughn, we're going to go ahead and launch the next poll. Uh, I know I just closed the last one, but but I want to, we spent a while on Q&A there and, and I want to launch this next one before you get started. So this question, my knowledge level on these topics coming into today's webinar is not a low, medium, high, or I could teach this class. And we will give you uh, just a moment to get that one answered for us. And then we will let Vaughn launch into what is happening in the wild world of collections in the IRS. What's new? So we'll hear about that in just a moment. But Vaughn, do we have any Q&A we need to touch before we do that? I, I think just uh, a lot of people expressing that I think the accounting and bookkeeping side of, of this is going to be a challenge. A couple of the questions I'm going to merge together. Do the wages paid to employees that are forgiven end up on their W-2? That would be a yes. Yes, they do. And also, if we don't deduct the expenses, how are the heck are we going to tie out wages on the W-2, W-3? and report on the return. So if you, I think we can combine those together here real quick um, as I check through the rest. Yeah, so, so Vaughn's absolutely right. I mean, when you pay wages, they get included on the W-2. It doesn't matter how the employer paid for those. So that's going to be the same answer if we used a credit, right? So if we have a credit under uh, the FFCRA or if we took an, an employer retention credit, which we're going to talk about later, we don't reduce the W-2 by those amounts, by any stretch of the imagination. Our gross payroll uh, for that employee is going to be what is put on the W-2 in most cases. I mean, obviously, there are some things that deduct box one. We're aware of that. But but we don't deduct for these credits. So that's, that's sort of the bottom line. And we don't deduct for the PPP or the EIDL. The W-2 stays exact same guidance we've always had. The bookkeeping piece, I'm going to consider beyond the scope of what we can do in IRSC, to be perfectly honest. Mm -hmm. um, and so that's going to be beyond the scope of, of what I'm going to get into. That doesn't qualify for IRSC, so I have to be kind of careful about what we do there. 
All right, we're going to give another 10 seconds on, looks like we need another 100 people to answer here. Um, so we're going to close it in 10, 9, 8, 7, 6, 5, 4, 3, 2, 1. And Vaughn, we'll let you get started. Sounds like a plan. So we're going to first kick into, uh, if you anybody out there has had some issues with faxing power of attorneys to the cap unit, you have realized they've, I think, literally just turned the fax machine off. So we cannot get through. Uh, that's going to continue to be the case. They are slowly trying to bring people back here in out the end of April. We do not have an ETA date of when that will be turned back on. So they're still putting out there. They're not accepting new requests. So probably like many of you, I have a folder that I've just stacked up with new power of attorneys I need to fax in. And I, just a little note, with the volume of power of attorneys that are going to be faxed in once it flips open, what do you do? Do you send it the first day and you just hope it doesn't get lost? Do you wait a week and let it clear out? I think you're going to run into a lot of the things that the banks did this file this past Monday when SBA turned on the portals to put in for new PPP applications, the whole thing crashed. Please be aware, I think we're going to have a lot of problems once they open back up getting our power attorneys processed because there's going to be such a volume coming in and it's going to be so easy to lose things. So keep a list, this is just my own recommendation, keep a list of the power of attorneys you have and whatever service you're using to log in, make sure you continue to, to check in maybe every couple of weeks. For me, or the software I use, about two weeks normally I'm in. If it's not working, you're gonna to have to resend it. I can just imagine the volume that the CAF unit is gonna to have to go through, but I don't just send it once and assume it's gonna go through. So that's just a, a, a thought of my own. And, and let me just add to that, Vaughn, if you were seeing a two week turnaround before, you cannot expect that. No way, right? Come back. Yeah. So I it's going to be much like after the shutdown we had last year, mm -hmm. except I think worse. Uh, you know, that, and I'm glad you brought that up because last year we were, IRS was closed for about a month, right? Give or take. And now we're going to be down, I think we're going to, if it goes through July 15th, we're going to see multiple months and that's huge backups of mail. We thought it was bad after that. Every expectation of turnaround time, whether it's collections, whether it's mailing things in, is just going to be so stretched out. It's going to be a very frustrating time for all of us, but also reminding our clients of why we're here for them, because we're going to be there for them for a long time. So just wanted to throw that out. All right, we're going to couple, cover a few things in the collection side of this. Um, as we decided to add in that the fact that the offering compromise form itself was updated this month. Great time to update some new forms to the IRS. I guess they had some time to do it. So I just want to point out a few of those things. This is not necessarily related to COVID-19 uh, before we touch on some of the collection challenges um, and changes during COVID. So if you do offers in compromise, all the forms, the 433A OIC, that's the individual form, the 433B OIC for businesses, and the 656 called an offering compromise and knocks out as much off not a collection as I do. Let me clarify that. I don't often hear the IRS call this a contract, but in one of the write-ups, they absolutely call this a contract and it clearly is. But the document itself, the 656 has the con doesn't have that word anywhere, but I did find that reference in another bit of uh, the material and I found that interesting. They do approach the 656 as the contract and the A or B OIC form as a supporting uh, financial statement to go with that contract and then you submit supporting documents. So, uh, so Juan, let me, let me jump yeah. in here. And, and as someone who, who does quite a few of these, I want to ask you a question. Go for it. Uh, let me rephrase that. I want to ask you two questions. All right. Are we limited Don't to three? Out of the first question, because it's going to lead me to the second one. Okay, go for it. The first question is, can you, which is different than should you, can you with a POA, Sign a 433A, a 433B, or a 656. Are you so? Can you or should you? Is the question. Can you is the first question. Should you is going to be yeah, the second. I'm going to answer the second one. You should never sign this form. Let me just get. I don't care what you can do. This is you're going to get me fired up. This isn't any document that's signed under penalty of perjury that you're signing for a client. You need to walk the other way. As many of you out there who may have heard me, me talk, I am very opinionated on certain things. You may disagree with me, and I, it's perfectly fine. I will never sign an A, a B, or a 656. I don't care what it is if it has a penalty of perjury statement. That's just me. 
Yeah, we're we're in complete agreement, which is why I led you to that. And I've look, I know there's people out there who are signing nine forty ones for their payroll clients. Stop doing that. I mean, I'll tell you right now, one of the we'll talk a little bit about trust fund today because that's one of the guidance issues. If the IRS ever really wanted to push it, anybody who signs a nine forty one is available to be interviewed for trust fund. And just because you assume all the payments were made and, and you've tracked it all, do not for convenience, because that's what I see the most when I deal with a trust fund case, are tax professionals, accountants signing the 941 because it's just easier to do it than track the client down because they don't have e-file set up. Please do not sign 941s in tax forms for your clients. Can I, I, you're just setting yourself up for somebody to take advantage of that if they needed to. Knox, cool me off. I don't know. Got uh, I'm I'm good with that. I, you know, there's there's some distinction between reporting agent and and I just want to clarify on one thing you said. You're still signing even if you're e-filing. There's still a signatory on yeah. the document, yeah. and so just be aware of you know if you are a reporting agent, then there are some differences in your liability to some extent, but there's still some liability. And so, uh, you know, what, what Vaughn is getting at is someone who sort of special and Vaughn does sort of specialize in trust fund recovery penalty cases. What he's suggesting to you is why are you opening yourself up to that liability? I, uh, yeah. So in my collection world, I do quite a bit of payroll tax cases and then trust funds. So we do this quite a bit. And I just, I just want people to be careful about that because I don't know if that's being taught in some other collection classes or what that is, but that's liability you do not need. And I'd be curious if your E&O insurance would approve of that, but that's a question to be taken up with them. So we'll we'll move on from that. Uh, thanks, Knox, for getting me fired up about that. I appreciate that. <laughs> uh, all the offers, some other changes. They've updated the filing fee. It's now $205. And one note to add on the offer form, the 43A OIC, and 433B OIC is they've now added virtual currency. This was on the standard 433A form, not OIC, or 433B form that revenue officers use. They updated that, I believe it was in 2018, but they just added this to the offer form uh, in my comparison. So just be aware when you're doing offers, now those all match up. Okay, next one, low income certification. This is a big change. Uh, before the the original, the last offer form had just gross monthly household income as you calculated that on the 433A. That was the, the amount that you then compared to the low income certification. Now you've got a choice. You can use the AGI from your last file return or the equivalent of 12 times the gross monthly income on your A. Now, this is a personal opinion. I think, as I said here, a sneaky change by the IRS. Because I will tell you, I look, a lot of people bring me, when I teach classes, they'll bring me their file on an offer that they lost or so on. And, and I'll share in a minute a couple of other areas that I always find when people say, why did I lose? I'm going to share those in a minute. But this one is comparing the calculation on your AOIC to what the last file return says and ratioing the income. Because if they don't match, you need to have an answer for that. And there can often be one. There's no reason those have to be the same. But if you can't answer that question, you've got a problem with your offer right there. And, and just from this low income certification encourages you to make that comparison. I think any of you who are doing offers should have these little checks that you know the IRS is doing when they look at an offer. Uh, another one, this was a new warning on the 656 form. And I just bolded just this first sentence, but you want to read this section. The IRS will not compromise any amounts of restitution assessed by the IRS. So I just, that jumped out at me when we looked through this form. It also talk, goes in more detail on IRC 965, which deals with deferred foreign income. So just be aware of this section uh, if you're doing your offers. And this was new as the April 2020 form. One other note, uh, they now outlined you have the ability to use EFTPS to make your offer payments. Uh, no issues with that. All right. Now, we're going to deal with, these are in your documents. Uh, Knox, if you don't mind checking behind me, I meant to check through the handout and give specific page numbers because I know you included this. But the IRS has put out um, some field collection letters. Uh, it's, at, it's, it's at the very end of the, oh, uh, yeah, I don't remember where that is. But if you look at the bookmarks, they're in there. 
Okay, that's right. So check out the bookmarks, but you're going to find these collection notices and we're going to lightly cover these. Um, I did want to quote from the Internal Revenue Manual here in this section because TIPRA comes up quite a bit in the section dealing with um, some of the, uh, the, the changes as of COVID-19. So when you see TIPRA, they're referencing the Tax Increase Prevention and Reconciliation Act of 2005. Now, why are we going back 15 years? Because this is the act that I think a lot of you have heard, if you submit an offer and the IRS doesn't respond to it and deems accepting it within 24 months, you just get it. Well, it's actually TIPRA where this all started. So when you're seeing that reference, it's not, it's not defined out in these letters. Uh, one of the letters deals with offers in compromise and this countdown against the TIPRA date. So I just wanted to define that, have it in the slide for you, pull this right out of the IRM. Again, that's the 24 month period and it starts on the date the offer is received by the IRS. And you as a, a taxpayer cannot voluntarily extend this date. Yeah, so, and what he's, what he's talking about when he says letters, by the way, these are internal memos that were sent out to the field uh, by SBSE. So uh, small business self-employed. So just, you know, these are internal memos. We have provided those for you so that you have a copy of those. I think I included four or five. I don't remember how many of them I included, but they are in the handouts. Uh, after Vaughn asked me to include those. So those are there. Perfect. Thanks, Knox. <clears throat> so let's let's talk a little bit about, uh, this is just a continuation of the Internal Revenue Manual section. I, I left this in there as well, <clears throat> that your offer is deemed to have been accepted after 24 months unless the offer has been rejected, returned, withdrawn by the taxpayer, or deemed withdrawn because you've missed a periodic payment. And I wanted to leave this in because how the IRS is going to be processing these periodic payment offers is directly addressed um, in this IRS notice that we're dealing with. Okay, so let's kick into that. The following guidance is only good through July 15. So right now the IRS is still able to process ex acceptance of offers. Um, returns of offers, they will not return any offer prior to July 15th for failure to provide information or failure to file delinquent return. So if you've got a re, uh, had a request back from the offer specialist uh, for additional documentation and your deadline was uh, prior to, uh, after April 2nd, excuse me, up through July 15th, you essentially have an extension all the way up to July the 15th to submit that. So you don't want, if you're caught, uh, you need to better say that. April 2nd to July 14th, if that was your deadline, you have until July 15th. Man, one of those days. Uh, payments. IRS has been instructed to not return an offer due to payment non-compliance. This comes back to those partial pay agreements again, where I'll, you're supposed to be sending in uh, a monthly payment. Uh, and if you have not been able to do that, you have until July 15th to follow up. Now, I will say, as we read through this, I think it's critical to make sure you're communicating with your offer specialist. If you can't get them on the phone, you need to be documenting that in an e-fax. You should have had all that information on the letter they sent out. Please do not just depend on these notices and the direction and assume everything is fine. The, the IRS revenue officers I've been dealing with have been very reasonable, but I have stayed in constant communication with them on any active cases. And I think offer specialists, the, the same thing would apply. Now, uh, this letter will also will cover if you're dealing with a TIPRA statute that reaches 22 months. It also deals with the financial impact of COVID-19, where a taxpayer can withdraw an offer and then later resubmit when they say the financial situation has, quote unquote, stabilized. So just be aware, uh, it's a weird window to submit it, have already an offer submitted some time ago, and you're close to this statute. If you're that close, make sure you read this notice and be communicating with your offer specialist. Okay, we've got a couple extra minutes today because the uh, we never did get our final guidance from um, PPP from SBA in time. So we've talked about some future uh, webinars we'll be doing under VASEA. So I wanted to, to give you a preview of two different ones. Uh, top 10 options of IRS resolution. This is a great course if you're just getting a comfort zone for resolution and also offers how to evaluate when an offer is a good collection option for your client. And we're going to come back to this whole offer situation in a second. This top 10 options, this is something uh, my office and I have come up with on this class. 
This may not apply to you what you do in your practice, but this is in order of what I do the most of. And the reason is, look at number nine, and as I go through this and see where offer comes in, and I'll come back to that in a minute. So for me, the, the most thing that I do are partial pay installment agreements, and that can be with on with national office ACS cases or with revenue officers, but partial pay is the most of what I do. Uh, plenty of people qualify for fresh start in the streamline. I still do quite a bit of uncollectible statuses. I will tell you, uh, revenue officers know if you are as a power of attorney, if amazingly every one of your clients when you submit is uncollectible, they do track that. I have had them tell me that before. So please, if you're always going for uncollectible, you're setting yourself up for a really bad reputation, which means every time you submit it for in the future or that case, you're going to go through a whole nother level of review uh, if you think you can make every client uncollectible. And I'm not talking just in COVID-19. I think right now we're going to find a lot of people uncollectible now. I'm just talking in general um, is, is going after uncollectible. Now, all that being said, it is still number three on this list. Installment agreement full pay. Uh, this is not as simple as it sounds. Someone may owe quite a bit and on a financial statement show an exorbitant amount of the payment. But how do you work that that final payment down to an acceptable number the IRS will accept and it'll still full pay, but not be the full amount shown on a 433A or B. Not every revenue officer likes to go down that path, but it is, it is something to definitely go for. All right, we're gonna cover a few, the next three things, even before we get to penalty abatement and offers. Bankruptcy, I see a lot of cases where they don't need my help. Based on where they are, they really should consult with a bankruptcy attorney and see if that would address even more issues than dish their individual taxes, not trust fund though, but their individual taxes. Adjusting returns. Uh, the best example I always give is a 941 where owners are in cash flow crunch and have not been able to deposit all of their paychecks, but they didn't fix their 941. So if they're gonna turn those checks back in, they can't keep them. If they're gonna turn them back into their payroll service. Then that 941 can be adjusted and their payroll taxes um, pulled back down some. So. I see that quite a bit. I even liked, I even see a lot of people who full pay their total balance before I get to offers. And now before I crush on offers, penalty abatement, uh, it's the number one requested choice of clients. It is not in my that high in my top 10. And no, I'm not including the, uh, the easier to get first time penalty abatement. The one I always like to, because I deal with a lot of high dollar work is if someone owes $250,000 and 50,000 is penalty, I, the first question I'm going to ask him is, even if I win penalty abatement, can you pay the 200000 that's left? If the answer is no, then why are you bothering to charge him for penalty abatement? Let's just deal with the 250 and not charge him additional fees that doesn't return dollars in their pocket. Now, that being said, on number seven, if they're going to full pay that total balance, I'm all for every penalty abatement we can go for because that saves them dollar for dollar. But no, I do not push penalty abatement unless I think it's going to bring a positive back to that client. And offers. Uh, the reason for me, number and this may be different now post COVID-19, but the reason I talk about offers um, being so low is so many people do not qualify. And I'm going to hit on the top two, two of the top reasons in just a minute. And I leave innocent spouse at the end. And I'll tell you why, because most people who ask for innocent spouse are still married. I'm sorry, if you filed a joint return and you're still married, the chance of you getting an innocent spouse should be zero. So it works for if there's been a divorce or a separation, there's plenty of opportunities there, but it's not a get out of jail free card and a joint return and you're still married. And I think that's where a lot of people try to use it. So there's a that's a whole class in itself and we go in far more detail in the top 10, but I wanted to share that in context of the offer things we just talked about. And then um, on the next slide, Knox, is the top two things I see that stop most offer applications right away, you've got to be current filing and paying your tax returns. I, I can't stress that one enough. And yes, I did give a little ex, uh, conversation between the taxpayer and the IRS here that I'll read out to you. Taxpayer, please give me an offer. Are you current filing and paying your returns? Well, no. So what you're telling the IRS is that you fell behind in the past, and now you owe the IRS and you will continue to owe the IRS in the future since your returns aren't filed and paid and current and you want a settlement now and the taxpayer has no answer for that. 
look, people, you need to file those returns. And sometimes it's meeting with the client and making sure and say, this is not the best time for you to file an offer. You've struggled with staying current. In this case, let's get 19 filed and make sure 2020 is on, on pace for your estimates and so on. And then let's take a look at an offer. But filing an offer without reviewing this in detail is setting your client up for failure. And number two. And before we do that, let me go ahead and launch our next polling question. Sounds good. And this polling question is, why did you choose to attend this webinar today? And in this case, I want you to choose all that apply. So all that apply. It's free. I need to see your CPE, the topic or topics that are being covered today because I love Vaughn, because I love Knox, because I'm a proud member of the Virginia Society of Enrolled Agents, because I was just bored today. Or maybe there's something I didn't think of to include on this question. So uh, let us know why did you choose to attend this webinar today? And we'll give you about 30 seconds. Vaughn, you want to look and see if we've got any Q&A real quick? Oh, Lord. I'm sure we got tons. So I didn't keep up as we were chatting. So let me just skim it and see if anything jumps out at me. Uh, I've got one question. What if you're the person making the payments and know that they've been paid? And they're talking about the 941. I get it. I still don't sign it. I don't want to have any. And, and I think some will probably consider that an extreme view uh, that if you know everything's been paid and all is good. I just do not sign 941s and I don't sign collection forms, period. Uh, I just watch too many things that you think is taken care of turn into a problem later. Um, but though I get your point, I still wouldn't sign it myself. But that's just my personal opinion. Let's see. Um, I'll save that one for later. I need to think about that one. Is the I, is the IRS processing any paper returns at this time? So my understanding that's a no. Knox, correct? Yeah, that is basically a no. I will tell you that. You know, they just brought back this week a few people, and part of what they're doing is starting to open some of the mail. So what they're doing is sorting these into stacks. And if it is a return that is a refund paper return, then they are putting those in a stack to process first. The second category is if it is a return with one of the refundable credits. Let me rephrase that. If it's a return with an 8867 attached. Um, and so... You know, if, if there are due diligence issues, then they are putting those on because they have some 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 statutorial requirements to give those out in a timely fashion. And so those two categories of returns are coming first on the paper file. But right now, all they're doing is opening the mail and sorting it because they are on a very limited staff. So the short answer to that is they're not really processing anything yet, but they are beginning to prioritize those returns with refund claims and those returns with refundable credits. A couple questions dealing with uh, collection phone lines. So the only collection phone line that I know is working is directly to a revenue officer. So ACS is hit or miss. Have you been getting through? Because I hadn't tried in the last day or two, but they've been down. They're hit or miss. So mm -hmm. they're mostly, you know, they're working from home. So, uh, so I that's still a miss. <laughs> it's a mess. It's a mess. And it's a total hit or miss. You know, okay. you might you might try 15 times in the day and get through one, but yeah, I'm not getting through. So I've at this point kind of shelved ACS for the most part. Um, and what I'm doing though is to cover my basis on a couple of those clients is I am mailing, knowing that no one's gonna open it right away. I am documenting, I'm writing a letter saying they cannot make the payment due to COVID, asking um for anything along that line. So I'm trying to at least document that and, and make sure that I mail it certified so I can track it. Uh, but at this point, um, I'm not getting through consistently and it's just not a good use of my time. Cool. So we're closing this poll, but Vaughn, you'll be happy to know 365 of today's participants are here because of you, buddy. Whatever. That's, I think my wife just logged in 365 times and faked, but that's whatever. <laughs> All right, let's get going. This is the next big one. And I'll, I'll tell you, on this offer, the second issue, a lot of people come to me and they tell me stories. They get in this huge, long conversation with a client who wants to do an offer and they waste an hour of their time. They can't get them to stop talking and they don't think they're a good candidate. So this is what I share in my offer class as a way to get out of it, five minutes or less. 
as soon as they say offer, I just cut them off. Not being rude, but said, hey, before we go to the depth of all the things you want to talk about, let me just ask this question. How much equity do you have in your house? And how much equity do you have in your investments? If you can get by these questions for me, I'll then consider having a deeper conversation. But if some, and this, a lot of the offers I see that fail that clients, I mean, not clients, other tax professionals come to me and ask, hey, why did this fail? This is the first place I look, and generally this is the problem. And I'll give you a specific example. They had a client who owed about 45,000 in tax, and they had easily 70 to $80,000 in equity in their house. People, that's offer 101. It is the equity in your assets, and there is an adjustment to the house equity because they're giving you that 20% adjustment for sale and all these other things. But there is an adjustment there, but it's not enough to wipe out that much equity. If your equity exceeds your tax liability, you're not a good offer candidate. And I know there's hardship, but I'll tell you, hardship offers are really difficult to win. And the IRS national average is already over 80% they don't accept because of the national offer factories and so on. But this is the first place I start. And then if they get past the equity conversation and I'm comfortable, then we can start spending maybe some more time talking about income and expenses, but only if they pay me an upfront fee to even waste my time. People will talk to you over and over again about this and you will lose time you cannot bill for and find out they're a bad candidate. Knox, and I can see you're ready to share a few things. So knock it out. Yeah, I'm going to kick myself later for this because we don't really have time, but I'm going to ask anyway, because I think this is an area that there's a lot of confusion about. So there are some times when we are dealing in collections, we're going and getting some denial letters from mortgage lenders or banks makes sense. And there are other times when it is not going to help. Can you talk some about that? Oh, man. Um, so there are definitely times, uh, just in general, what situations would that apply to? I mean, the first one that comes to mind is I'm dealing with a revenue officer who's threatening to seize and so on. And if I can show that there's no lender willing to give funds on that equity, I've got a better basis to push back on them on that seizure and maybe prevent the actual seizure from being uh, to occur in the first place. And that's not going to work for every revenue officer, but that's the first thing that comes to mind because that's where I see it the most. Was that where you were thinking, Knox, or are you thinking more in the lines of the offers? Yeah. So, so for, well, let me just be specific right now. Is that going to work for an offer? See, there'll be somebody out there who's won an offer with the way you just described. All right, I, let me I, let me rephrase it. Should that work in an offer? I don't do that. And, and let me tell you why. Because it's just as easy for the offer special to kick you into a partial pay installment agreement or uncollectible status and turn your offer away. And remember, everybody, that one of the biggest downsides of an offer is the extension on the collection statute. I don't do that lightly for clients because... You know, let's say there's someone who's retired, they had a small business, they have a large liability, but then now they lost everything. They're on Social Security. Why do an offer when they're likely going to be uncollectible, which means the IRS will probably not review them every 24 months because a future tax return will not show they have collection ability and probably just write out the rest of the collection statute and have it be written off. I call that a backdoor offer. And, and I look at that in context of how much time is left it's this conundrum, right? The, the, it's a 10 year collection statute. When you've only got three or four more years left on that, the IRS is more likely to accept an offer, but they'd love for you to put one in so they can extend that. Versus early in the collection statute, you're adding more time you don't need and the IRS is less likely to take an offer because they go, well, we got plenty of time to collect on you in the future. So let's just wait this out a little longer. And heck, I'll just make you uncollectible, but it just cost you what, a couple of years? of extension of your collection statute potentially to get uncollectible, which we could have gotten from the beginning. So I think going back to the top 10 list, the reason I like to teach that class first is I think you need to start from there and work your way down because the bottom opportunities have some real impact, especially offers if you lose. And the IRS national average, my average is higher than the national average by far, but I talk I to hope so. offer than I do. I'm trying not to be has sound as bad as that sounds. I really talk far more people out of doing offers than accept. Yeah. So so let me go back and answer my own question. And the short answer is you should never think in an OIC scenario 
that I can go and get a bunch of denials and they're going to be okay with this offer when there is equity. I agree with that, 100%. You should never think that. Now, CNC, I'm going to give you a different answer. But for OIC, for offers, you should never think that way. I was leaving a door open because I wasn't exactly sure that was going, but I guess there could be some, but you're right. I don't do that. Uh, last thing in the, the notices that were posted that uh, the Knox uh, put into the handouts, there are some statements dealing with assessment of trust fund in the assessment statute and appeals. I, I'm not going to go into this in great detail. If you're dealing with a trust fund case uh, and you're dealing with assessments or a 4180 trust fund interview, or you need to appeal a trust fund assessment, you really want to read these at a high level. It just says, the IRS is allowed to extend the expiration of the ASED, the assessment statute expiration date by 30 days, um, if it would have expired between the window of April 6th and July 14th. And if you um, also taxpayers have the ability now until July 15th to appeal a trust fund assessment um, if that's necessary. I, I really stress, and I'll stop and I'll, I'll leave this alone. If you're dealing with trust fund cases, when you're dealing about teaching collections, if getting a fresh start installment agreement is maybe 101 or 102 class, like in college, trust fund is like 501, like grad school. Please don't get into trust fund cases unless you're ready for that. I was very fortunate to, to learn from a revenue officer who worked at the IRS for 28 years. Um, without that, I would not be doing the level of trust fund cases I do. And I do see a lot of bad trust fund work by representatives. Please make sure you're ready to handle those kind of cases because it does have a substantial impact. Yeah, totally agree. And and Vaughn knew that we were in agreement because we've discussed that before. The next poll is up. What is or are your preferred methods of receiving your continuing education? Select as many of these as apply. In person, self-study from a text, webinar, or recordings of webinars. What are your favorite ways to receive your continuing education? We'll leave that up for about another 30 seconds. And we're going to press forward because I... I uh, I made Vaughn spend too long there by asking questions and I shouldn't have done that. So families first, that was totally my fault. Families first coronavirus response act. We're going to deal with two bills that are contained within this act. The first is the emergency family and medical leave expansion act. The second, the emergency paid sick leave act. And then we're going to talk about the tax credits that relate. But before I do that, I want to mention that you must post a poster. We have a requirement to display this poster. So you need to share that with your clients, but you also need to do this yourself. How do you post a poster? You simply put it on the board where all of the employees go. But wait a second, Knox, my employees are teleworking right now. Then you email it to all of them. So that's sort of the nuts and the bolts of that. I have included a PDF of that poster inside of your handouts. So you can find that there. So the Emergency Paid Sick Leave Act is where we are providing paid sick time to the employee if they are unable to work or telework as the result of a federal, state, or local quarantine or isolation order that is related to COVID-19, or if they have been advised by a healthcare provider to self-quarantine, or if the employee is experiencing symptoms and seeking a medical diagnosis. These are what we call the first three items, and it is significant that they're in the first three because they pay at a different level than four through six do. So these first three you can think of as impacting the employee themselves. The second set doesn't necessarily impact the employee as much, but in this case, we're caring for an individual who is impacted, or we are caring for a son or daughter of the employee if the school or place of care of the son or daughter has been closed or the child care provider has been closed or you're experiencing substantially similar conditions. So those are four through six. Now, there are accepted persons. Healthcare provider employees can be accepted. Emergency responder employees can be accepted. What is the duration of the paid sick time under this act? Well, it's two weeks for full-time employees, so that's up to 80 hours. And for part-time employees, it's the number of hours that's equal to the number of hours that they work on average over a two-week period. If it's not consistent, then we're going to average that over six months. And if they didn't work for the previous six months, we're going to look at a reasonable expectation of the employee at the time of hiring for that period. 
The employer cannot require any other leave or paid time off or sick days to be used first when they meet these criteria. The leave is available regardless of the amount of time that they have been employed. And this is from the very first day worked, however, does not include applicants. It does, however, include those who have been hired but not yet started. So they've signed a contract or even an email that says, hey, you're hired, start on such and such a date but then they're unable to because of a COVID-19 related issue, they get the benefit even if they have not yet worked an hour. I'm not going to get into labor law here. You need to consult an attorney on that, but be careful about terminations or layoffs. Uh, definitely don't do that to avoid these payouts. That could be a bad problem. What about employees that work under a PEO or that sort of situation? The bottom line is that they are included and the effective date on this act is April the 1st. That was done by administrative action uh, in the act itself. It actually said April 2nd or sooner, and administratively it became April 1. So employers, these are between one and 500 employees to qualify. And the bottom line is that we're going to pay 511 per day for full-time employees or up to that if they meet one of those first three criteria that affect, affect the employee themselves. So that's up to 5110 in the aggregate per employee. Now, if it's one of the, the next categories, they're caring for a family member, son or daughter out of school, that kind of situation, then we're going to be up to 200 a day or 2,000 in the aggregate. And the way we calculate this is we take two-thirds of their regular pay, but not less than minimum wage, up to these maximums that we have described here. So again, employers are the private entity or individuals. Uh, there are some exemptions that are available. I already mentioned that healthcare providers can be exempted. Emergency responders can be exempted. There's another one that we weren't sure what was going to happen with, and we thought we need some guidance on this. And that's small businesses with fewer than 50 employees, if the imposition of these requirements would jeopardize the viability of the business as a going concern. We did get some guidance on that, so I want to talk about that how you can claim this exemption. And it has to be an authorized officer of the business that determines and puts in writing that the provision of paid sick leave or expanded family and medical leave would result in the small business's expenses and financial obligations exceeding the available business revenues and cause the business to cease operating at a minimal capacity. Now be aware, we're going to talk about in a minute, there is a way to get an advance on these credits, but there's about a two-week delay. So if you can get the advance and still be viable, then I don't think you can claim this. So be aware of that. We'll talk about Form 7200 in a little bit. The other thing is if the absence of the employer employees requesting this leave would turn into a situation where it would provide substantial risk to the operational capabilities or financial health because of that particular employee's specialized skills, knowledge of business, or responsibilities. Now, again, remember, this is only for those small businesses with 50 or less than 50 employees, and they can, you know, they can certify one of these. And then the other is that there are just not sufficient workers who are able to operate at a minimal capacity. And so if you can clarify, if you can claim one of those things, then you can be exempted under these provisions. So that's the new guidance that came out on that that we did not have the last time we talked about this. Uh, let's talk about the relationship to paid leave of the Emergency Family and Medical Leave Expansion Act. So first of all, the first 10 days are not covered by this provision, but of course they may be unpaid, but they also more than likely are going to be using paid sick leave. So we're going to cover those first 10 days under the paid sick leave, and then we're going to cover the next 10 weeks under this for a total of 12 weeks. How do we do this? Same exact calculation. We're taking two thirds, except in this case, it's up to 200 a day, which is going to be 10,000 in the aggregate per employee. So Remember, this is separate, so it's 10000 on this side. The paid sick leave is going to be either 2000 or 5110 depending which way they qualified. And in the same way, we're going to calculate for part-time as before. So again, we're going to get a total of 12 weeks of leave. The labor law issues are beyond our scope, but in general, jobs are protected. You cannot get rid of someone to avoid paying this. And employers have a responsibility to notify the employees of the availability of these benefits. We talked about that and how to post that poster. And this benefit is triggered if you are unable to work or telework 
due to the need to care for the son or daughter who is under 18 years of age because the school or place of care has been closed. So this term public health emergency means an emergency that's been declared at the federal, state, or local authority. So that's practically everywhere. The term school means an elementary or secondary school. And the other thing to be aware of is this question that I think a lot of people had. And that is, are the stay at home or shelter in place orders the same as quarantine or isolation orders? So for example, I live in Virginia. Vaughn lives in Virginia. We are under a stay at home order, the longest one in the nation, and through June the 10th. Are, does that qualify as an isolation or quarantine order? And if so, can I take this leave? So we're going to answer that question. And this is answered in question 60 of the FAQ, if you want to go look that up. And the answer here is that, yes, it does qualify. But in order for it to qualify you for leave, it has to be the reason that you're unable to work or telework. So again, like we said previously, if you're able to telework, not a problem. But this last sentence is interesting. You may not take paid leave due to such an order if your employer does not have work for you to perform as the result of the order or for other reasons. In that scenario, you go to unemployment. So that clarification, I think, was significant uh, that we did not have when we last talked about this law back in part one. So uh, that, I think, is significant. I was not surprised at the stay-at-home orders qualifying. Some people were. I was not surprised by that. I was surprised at the push to move people to unemployment. I was surprised by that because that seems counterintuitive to the push that we got in the CARES Act where we pushed people off of unemployment and into the PPP. So kind of an interesting uh, turnabout that we see there. Effective date on this, again, going to be April 1, like we talked about, and PEOs and multi-employer bargaining agreements are included. There are payroll credits available for both the required paid sick leave and the family leave, and they apply to wages from April 1 to December 31, again, for the period that they're going to qualify, and it covers 100% of qualified wages plus a pro rata share of the employer's qualified health plan expenses. So lots of coverage there. We're going to go ahead and launch our next polling question. And by the way, on the last poll, interesting, 49% of you said that webinars was your uh, preferred way of getting education. So kind of interesting. This question, the FFCRA or the Family's First Coronavirus Response Act requires me to post a new poster. I can do that by select the best answer here. Posting it in the break room, emailing it to my employees. I need to do both of the above, or this is not important. Just ignore it. And with that, Vaughn, do we have any Q&A we want to tap? On the note of your question, uh, we've had a few questions. Is there a copy of the poster in the hand? You're muted. Uh, shouldn't be. <laughs> there you go. Oh, no. All right. Uh, they're asking if there's a copy of the poster in the handout. I couldn't put my fingers on one real quick. I am not hearing you, Vaughn, for some reason. Hmm. You Can might you need to refresh your browser. All right. All right. We uh, looks like we need another 150 people here. So we'll leave this up for just a smidge longer. We'll let Vaughn get back in here. He's on his way back. All right. Aha. Apparently, it was only I that couldn't hear. So my audio is turned off for some reason which is weird. Then it will be me. <laughs> Richard says, Knox is now deaf. <laughs> yes, the poster is in the handout. A couple of you are asking that. The poster is in the handout. Um, someone says that it's...
All right, anybody, am I back yet? Max, are we back? I'm back. Are you back? I can see and hear you. Can you hear me? Oh. <laughs> I can hear you. Sorry about that. I think I was actually the problem. All right. So I'm coming back online. Yep. It was uh it was it was me. Sorry about that. So no, not okay. sure why that happened. You nice gets tired of hearing me talk, so it was just part of this fun. It's okay. <laughs> All right. So getting back into the tax credits, let's talk about self-employed. Uh, in this case, it's a credit against self-employment tax. Hey, Max, just as a, I can't see the slides. I don't think and some people are saying the same thing. Oh, I guess I should share them, huh? All right. Let's let the slides come back, hopefully. Oh, what fun. So if everybody, apparently I think some people can't see you still, Knox, but they can see me. So we are working to get the slides back up. I had to go all the way back out, start with my original link uh, from Knox earlier today and come back in. So we are trying to get Knox back up. So in the meantime, while we do that, I'm going to take uh, a few more of the questions that I can do. And let's see. Uh, and by the way, for the Q&A, when you put in the question that you can't see us, we can't find the rest of the questions down too. All right, so I'm going to go to the top and just look at the ones I uploaded. Um, one of the questions that came out was how to look at a transcript and figure out your expiration of your CSET. So let's talk about that because that's not an easy answer. I'll give you the high level of this. The first place to look um, Typically, is a you'll see a code number on the left-hand side of a transcript called 150, 150. That's usually the best place. It's the processing date of the particular return, not when you submitted it, but the processing date. And that's generally the 150 code on a transcript. That's going to be the start of your 10-year window. Uh, now, there are things that can extend that. Filing an appeal, filing bankruptcy, also doing an offer. All three of those those are the main three that will extend, and there are other things, but those are the main three things that will extend the collection statute. So then you have to go down into the, de the details below on the statement, figure those dates up to get yourself in the neighborhood of what your actual expiration date is. So um, you can ask the IRS. They do not like to share that information typically because they know why you're asking, but you can ask them, and they have a computer system that can calculate it. So um, one to hit on that. Let's see. Um, everybody, just leave me a couple of notes. Apparently, I've lost Knox and the slides again. So are you able to still see me and hear me if I answer any more questions? I am watching the chat for any answers on this. Yes. OK. All right. So they're saying I can still hear me. So while Knox is working his side, he keeps coming in and out. So he's having the same challenges I had earlier, it looks like. All right. So let me hit another couple questions while I can. Uh, let's see here. Uh, Lynn asked if there's any published guidelines for EIDL compliance. She has not been able to find any. I agree, Lynn. Uh, it's just like we're running into some of the challenges, the PPP. Uh, guidance is what we're all hoping will come here soon. Um, so a lot of what we're doing is interpreting from the law itself and being careful not to go outside of that scope. Knox, I see you back and I see slides. Are we good? Yay! Yeah, we're back. All right. All right, All right awesome. So we're talking about self-employed individuals. Sorry for that, guys. Uh, Vaughn is the only okay. one that knew this, but I did something really dumb today. I left my power cable at home for my laptop. And so I had to pull out an old laptop that I keep in the office pretty much as a backup. And I'm operating from that old laptop today, and it's not new. And it's probably doing Windows updates or something in the background after having been turned off for three months or whatever. So uh, I apologize for that. But, you know, my my totally on my end, apparently. And yeah. All right. So moving forward, self-employed individuals, we have a credit against self-employment tax. These are basically the exact same calculations, except that they're not, right? So we use an average daily self-employment income for the taxable year. That's the way we're going to do these. 
And the way we do that is we take our net earnings from self-employment and we divide that by 260, which is in theory the working number of working days in the year. Then we multiply that by the applicable number of days. And this is refundable. We're going to claim that on our 2020 return. So the downside of this is that this cannot be claimed on the 7200, meaning that there is no advance payment of this. And they're not going to get any benefit right now unless they have employees, right? So for the self-employed individual who has no employees, they're just themselves, there is no benefit today, but they are going to get a benefit on the 2020 return and it's going to be against the self-employment tax and it's going to be refundable. So that will be nice. Uh, must have documentation. And I said, need guidance to tell us what that documentation is. And we're going to talk about that in just a moment, what that may look like. The other thing to be aware of is you cannot double dip with wages to exceed the max, but you can get up to the max. Uh, and so be aware of that. All right, so there's a notice 2020-21. This is the one that set the effective date to April the 1st. And that applies to all of these provisions that are included within FFCRA. And there's this really cool form, the 7200, a brand new form. And it allows us to take an advanced payment of the employer credits that are due to COVID 2019. It is used if you cannot reduce your employment tax deposits to fully account for the credits in that quarter. Obviously, you're not able to double dip here, right? So you can't do both. The IRS is saying that they're going to pay these two weeks from the filing. So I put this up on the screen for you, and I just want to highlight a couple of things in terms of how to fill this form out. So first of all, you can only file one quarter at a time. This is kind of like a 941. Vaughn, you talk about seeing some 941s that scare you. I've seen some paper filed 941s, which, by the way, is still a huge number. A lot of people don't e-file those, unfortunately. Um, but I've seen a ton of paper filed 941s where they try to combine quarters. Have you seen that before? Look, I've seen where someone scratched through the number and the quarter at the top of the year and tried to file a 2018 under a 2019 form and then wondered why their 2019 second quarter got replaced because they'd scratched through it. I've there's horror stories. We could have a class just on horror stories if we wanted to. So yeah. Yeah. So anyway, don't select multiple options. Select yeah. the appropriate quarter uh, and only one quarter per form. So be aware of that. You can have multiple forms per quarter though. So that's unlike a 941. You can actually do this at multiple points during the quarter, but only one quarter on a form. So the first thing that you're going to do, obviously, is fill out the top part. I don't think you need my help on that. But the part one here, you're going to select what kind of payer this is. So for most of our uh, taxpayers, it's going to be a 941. There are some people who, you know, are calendar year payers. So they're on 944, something like that. But for most people, it's going to be the 941. If this is a new business that started on or after January 1 of 2020, then you're going to answer yes here. But otherwise, then you're going to just move right along down to this next part, which is D. So uh, then we're going to move to part two. For now, ignore the first line other than noticing it's there. So we can claim the employee retention credit here. We're going to talk about the employee retention credit in a minute, but we can claim that on this form. But look at lines two and three. This is where we're going to claim our sick leave and our family leave. So these are the provisions under the Family First Coronavirus Act Response Act that we just spoke about. We're going to include those there, add to it our ERC, and then we're going to total that in line four. Then in five, we are going to put whatever we have withheld from our tax deposits, our payroll employment tax deposits. And then in six, we're going to put anything that we've put on a previous version of the form, previous filing of the form. So remember I said you can have multiple ones during the quarter. So in that scenario, even if it hasn't been processed yet, you're going to put what you claimed on a previous form here. So for example, a, you know, a, an organization, a business that is tight on funds, they may need to process, if they make a weekly payroll, they may be doing this every week. They may be filing one of these every week, but you're probably filing one of these with each payroll. 
uh, or in advance of each payroll because you need to get advanced these funds before your payroll deposit or your amount is going to exceed your payroll deposit and you need to go ahead and get the credit for that. The IRS has said they're going to credit these back within two weeks. So be aware of that. Then we're going to add five and six together on seven. We're simply going to subtract seven from four to get eight. And that is the amount that we are requesting. So it's really just that simple. Obviously, if you're a paid preparer, you're going to fill out the paid preparer part. I shouldn't have to tell you that. So the 7200 is pretty simple form. I just wanted to highlight those couple of things. First of all, that only file one quarter at a time on these, but you can file multiple times during the quarter and how you do that. I wanted to kind of highlight that. All right, so 2020-22, this is a notice that gives us relief from the penalty for the failure to deposit employment taxes if we are reducing those in order to pay these expenses that we just talked about. And so you are able to do that. Let's talk now about the DOL guidance. But before we do that, we're going to go ahead and launch our next poll. And we will be ready, Vaughn, to ask or answer rather uh, some Q&A questions here. So if you want to start looking towards something there, I can then we will do that. And this question, under the Family First Coronavirus Response Act, every employee is eligible for paid sick leave if, oh, wow, I misspelled there. I really do know the difference. I apologize for that. That is embarrassing. I'm the son of an English teacher. Oh, well, at least she's not on this webinar, I hope. Uh, but every employee is eligible for paid sick leave if there is a government stay-at-home order. Pretend that I knew how to spell when I typed that because I really did. I have no idea why I did that. Uh, but is this true or false? Vaughn, what Q&A do we have? Well, to be fair, Knox, the reason you don't recognize it is you didn't do that. I went there and sabotaged it just for fun. Sorry about that. Oh, okay. <laughs> uh, one clarification. Yes, I, I went very quickly through the whole conversation on CSEDs and looking at transcripts. We could do a 30, we probably would do a 30 minute to an hour class just of all the things you would need to consider for that. I'm just saying in three minutes, which is what I gave it, that's the first place I look on a transcript. I want to look at that 150 code. I want to see that processing date. And that's where I start. There are just so many factors and variables that go into changing that. Um, that should be a class in of itself. So just as a note, I saw that comment, wanted to share that. All right, here we go. Um, if the income from the loan is not counted, and then you cannot deduct the associated expenses, is this not the same as including it in the loan as income and deducting? I think there's just question before I read through that. Coming back to, I saw one question, I'm trying to find it, and I thought that was it, is are we saying that for some people, this is going to be potentially an increase in their income when you back out the expenses that normally would have been paid? And that's an absolute yes. Knox, take that one and run with it. But Yep. You already answered it. Yep. Absolutely. Um So someone was talking about, and this is, I think, happening quite a bit, is a tax professional has looked at, uh, let's say, a Schedule C filer. They go to the bank. This is the question. They tell him he qualifies for $32,500, and the bank approves it. But the tax professional has looked at that Schedule C and thinks the bank did the math wrong. And it should have been less. So I'm assuming we're talking about a PPP here. And uh, the short answer is that the taxpayer self-certifies on those calculations for the purposes of the PPP. Now, the lender does not actually have a requirement to get it right. They are supposed to look at it, see if it passes the smell test, and move on. Um, they are not required to. It is The burden is on the taxpayer to have submitted the calculation correctly which means that they're going to have some hurt on the forgiveness side. Or, I, so on that note, what if they you recognize the bank has overpaid you? You could return that portion and only use the amount that would have been forgiven. Now, is that, and that, as far as, I know this, we're waiting for this on the guidance, but from a calculation standpoint, on 75% of payroll, is it the loan amount or is it the portion at that you'd used and then, and not does include what you return back because it was too much or whatever else or so on. Yeah. So there, there is pretty clear guidance that if you return it actually by May the 6th or May the 7th, I've forgotten which date, but it's one of those two, then it is considered as if you returned it right away. 
And so if you have a taxpayer that needs to return funds uh, and they don't want it kind of counted in or charged any interest on it or anything like that or, or counted against them, then they need to do that within the next week is the short answer. So after that date, if you recognize later that you've been given too many funds by the bank because they miscalculated, you are also now missing the opportunity for forgiveness because you could throw your ratios off because you later on, it's just a payment of principal. It's not seen as a reduction to your baseline loan. That could be true. Again, we don't have our forgiveness regs for me to fully answer that. Fair enough. But I, I see that a lot too. Um, All right. We're going to leave the poll open okay. for five more seconds. Now, this one I want to tackle. Uh, has a client who have employees who work but didn't pay them for several weeks. So the client used their PPP money and paid the employees back pay from it. Would this be a valid use? I, I would say no, because you're supposed to base it on the eight week period from the loan origination date. Back pay is not what, what that would, it doesn't fit that definition, but Knox? So the question here really boils down to, is it the date that the work happened or is it the date that it was paid? And the way that everything reads that I have seen is the date that it was paid. So for example, Vaughn, um, you know, I'm making a pay, let's pretend that I get my funds today. I didn't, yeah. I didn't even apply, but let's pretend right. that I get my funds today. I'm making a payroll tomorrow because that's Friday, right? I'm making a payroll tomorrow for a two week period that ended last Friday. Do I include that payroll? Absolutely. Because that is within the eight week period after my disbursement, but it is for a period where the work transpired before the beginning of the eight week period. Well, let's follow his question then. Let's say he didn't pay them for two months and that's eight weeks. Are you now saying because I cut the check in my eight week period, but it's eight weeks of payroll in one check? Would so that qualify? The short answer is assuming it, you don't bump up against the maximums, you know, prorated for the hundred thousand, I think that's very likely to qualify. I Ooh. cannot answer definitively until we see the forgiveness regs. You're killing me because I'm I'm not I, I'm not quite there yet on that one, but I absolutely agree where you're coming from. I mean, I've the, the intention the rules too many the times is 100 percent to make sure people get paid. No question, right? And but so how many times I think watch them change the reading final guidance. Yeah, if we're reading for the intent of the law, I think what we're describing here does meet the intent okay. of the law. Got it. But, you know, I have not seen the forgiveness guidance, so I'm hesitant to make okay. a definitive statement other than to tell you, I I think there's a better than 50-50 shot. I think the likelihood is that would work because I okay. think it is consistent with the intent of the law. But you're asking me for personal opinion before I have seen guidance. I like all that. Good job, man. That was a tough one. All right, we're going to close that poll. I know we have other questions, but we got to move on. Yep. So the DOL documentation guidance, uh, first of all, an employer that intends to claim a credit, and, and we're talking about those credits that we just talked about, so the paid sick leave and the family expanded family leave that we just talked about, for the payment of these two things, the wages should retain appropriate documentation in its records. Now, you have to love this guidance. It should consult the applicable forms, instructions, and information and procedures from the IRS that must be followed to claim a tax credit. Isn't that a lovely guidance? Uh, however, the next part is actually helpful. And that is with respect to employees that take the expanded family and medical leave to care for their child whose school or place of care is closed or whose child care provider is unavailable, this is what you need to do. You need to provide documentation to support that leave. So, for example, you're going to include a notice that was posted on a website from the government. For example, here in Virginia, we have a state order that schools are closed. So we're going to go download that order. Or we're going to take uh, a copy of the notice on the school website or the daycare website or published in a newspaper or an email from an employee or official of the school. I have an email from the principal of the school, for example, that tells me it's closed. I have an email from the director of the daycare or child care provider tells me it's closed. I need some kind of documentation that tells me this is closed because 
of this shutdown order that has been declared at the federal, state, or local level related to these schools. So here in Virginia, that's a state-level thing that happened uh, where they shut us down for this duration. However, before the state shut us down, several of the local school districts, a few of them did. Um, And so, again, in that case, might cover both. All right. We're going to talk a little bit about the CARES Act. And when I say a little bit, I mean a little bit. We're mostly going to talk about the ERC. But I have put in your stats or in your file here uh, all of this information. And I will tell you that I put more slides in than we are going to cover today. But let's talk a little bit about the payroll protection program clarifications. Because the AICPA this week gave, in my opinion, some bad guidance. And so I want to correct that. And the first is, when does the eight-week period for forgiveness begin? Well, according to the AICPA, they say it begins whenever the heck you want it to. That is nowhere in the guidance whatsoever. And in fact, the uh, SBA has published an FAQ that says something different. The FAQ says that it begins on the day of the first disbursement. I would recommend that you do not follow erroneous guidance from the AICPA on this. I would recommend that you do follow guidance from the SBA on this. So I don't know how to say that any clearer. Be careful where you get your information from. Um, But it is clear to me from the FAQ on the SBA published that the eight-week period for forgiveness begins on the day of the first disbursement. Absolutely. Yeah, agree with that 100%. Yep. Uh, Does a housing allowance. Now, I deal with a whole lot of clergy and I deal with a whole lot of churches. So I I got this question a lot. I helped over 500 churches navigate the PPP process. Uh, And so you can imagine I spent a lot of time doing that. But this was a question I got a lot. Does the housing allowance provided to an employee count as payroll cost? The answer to that is yes. And we actually got that included in an FAQ as well, which I was very grateful for. And the other thing that I sometimes get questioned about is are farmers eligible? And we also got in an FAQ farmers are eligible. So that was good news for us as well. We're going to go ahead and launch a polling question. I think if I remember correctly that we're going to do that. Yep. This one should be easy to answer. The question is farmers can be eligible for the payroll protection program, true or false. And if you missed this one, you just were not listening. It's rare that I put a poll up like right after I give the answer, but you know, I'm being nice. Saying anything. All right. So we're going into questions here. Uh, Our most upvoted question so far. Uh, Let's see. Here's the example. It's an example. $100,000 gross income before loan forgiveness and $25,000 in payroll costs, net income of $75,000. If I get $25,000 to cover payroll and do not have to claim it as income, but then also do do not get to take it as an expense, my, in, my net income is now back at 100000 which is in essence taking the PPP loan um, as COD income. I do not disagree with you. Yeah, I, I just... And again, I think that there are some basis questions that get interesting but are beyond our scope today. Um, and I think the answers to those may, may vary depending whether we're talking about a partnership or an S-corp. Um, But nonetheless, we've got to move on. All right. We are going to, ooh, I need another 120 people. I'll leave it up for five seconds on this poll. Uh, Next part we're going to talk about is the employee retention credit. I know we have a lot of questions, Vaughn, but I need to push through a little bit and then we'll take them all. We'll, We'll stay on until we answer most of these questions. All right. The employee retention credit is a refundable credit, 50% of the qualified wages in each qualified quarter. And we can only count employee wages up to 10,000 in the aggregate for that employee. So that means there's a maximum $5,000 credit per employee. Okay. So again, it's 10,000 in aggregate. We get to take 50% of that. That means that our maximum credit is 5,000. I saw a couple of people in webinars teach this how can I be nice? It was just wrong. I don't know how to be nice. It was just wrong. So it is 5,000 maximum credit because you're counting wages up to 10,000 and then you take 50% of that. So it's a 5,000 maximum credit per employee. The eligible employers are any which were carrying on a trade or business during calendar year 2020 and 
had with respect to any calendar quarter the operation of their trade or business fully or partially suspended. We'll talk more about what that means, but it has to limit commerce, travel, or group meetings due to the coronavirus disease. Or they had a significant decline in gross receipts. So let's talk about how we define that. Well, we take the first calendar quarter in 2020 for which their gross receipts for the calendar quarter are less than 50% of the gross receipts for the same quarter in a prior year. And then we end that when it gets back to greater than 80%. So it's going to continue even if we get above 50%, but we're not back to 80%. We're going to continue to have quarters in which we can count uh, for this ERC period. All right. Again, talking about this, we, I don't know why I put that slide twice. I certainly didn't mean to do that. Tax exempt organizations are eligible and it's all 501Cs, does not have to be threes. So all tax exempt organizations are eligible here. That's going to include several associations. Wage calculation varies depending upon whether or not there are more than 100 employees. So if you have greater than 100, then only the employees that are not providing the services count. But if you have less than 100, you get to count all of your employees. And you're going to, you can't double dip, right? So you're going to exclude your family's first coronavirus benefits and aggregation rules have to be considered. I've given you the sections to go look that up and we'll talk a little bit more about aggravation in a minute. We do get to include third parties. So just because you use a PEO or or multi-employer bargaining agreement, you can still take advantage of this. What about employer size limitations? There are not any. You don't have to be under 500 employees here. You can be any size and be eligible for the ERC. What about employers in U.S. territories? Are they eligible? The answer to that is yes. What about self-employed individuals? I have seen this question a lot. What's the answer? No. What about household employers? I must have been emailed this one 10 times, Vaughn, and the answer to that is no. What about or what constitutes an order from an appropriate governmental authority? Does a press conference or an interview with the media meet that definition? The answer is no. That is not sufficient. It must actually be an order, a written order. And it must limit commerce, travel, or group meetings. It must affect the employer's operation of the trade or the business. So let's give some examples to kind of help us with that. So the governor of state Y issues an order that says that all non-essential businesses must close from March 20 until April 30th. This order provides a list of what are considered non-essential businesses. So gyms have to close, spas, nightclubs, barbershops, hair salons, tattoo parlors, et cetera. All of these have to close. Employers that provide essential services may remain open. Okay. So the question becomes here in this scenario, if I have one of these non-essential businesses Do I get to qualify? And the answer to that is yes, because it is a governmental order. It limits the operations of non-essential businesses. And so that entitles those employers of non-essential businesses to claim the ERC for qualified wages. Well, what if I'm not a non-essential business? Do I get to claim it? The answer to that is maybe. Don't you love those maybes uh, in the tax code? So the answer to that is maybe. You don't get to claim it by this, but you could potentially claim it if you had substantial decline in gross receipts, right? So we'll talk about some of that. Second example, the mayor of City Y holds a press conference in which she encourages all residents to practice social distancing. The statement during the press conference is not an order that limits commerce, travel, or group meetings, and so it is not a governmental order for the purposes of the ERC. Third example, we have a restaurant that is ordered by the local health department to close due to a health code violation. So answer in the chat for me. Do you think this person qualifies under this provision as a government order? And so they get the ERC. Answer that question for me in the chat. I am curious to see what your answers are on that one. 
All right. So the correct answer, and most of you are getting this, very good. The correct answer is no. The order is unrelated to COVID-19, and so it is not considered a governmental order for purposes of the employee retention credit. All right, what about if an employer voluntarily suspends operation of a trader business or reduces hours due to COVID-19, even though it is not required by a government order, is this employer going to be eligible to receive the employee retention credit? What do you think the answer to that would be? Go ahead and answer that in the chat. Well, you have to love it. This one's a maybe. An employer that voluntarily suspends is not subject to a governmental order. So there's no full or partial suspension of its operations due to a governmental order. So it will not qualify by that. However, it could potentially, if it has a significant decline in gross receipts, right? What about a governmental order that requires an employer to close its workplace, but the employer is able to continue operations comparable to its operations prior to the closure by requiring employees to telework. Can this employer claim the employee retention credit? This is going to be a lot of tax offices. Could this employer claim the employee retention credit? Well, the answer here is no. Because even though the employer's workplace may be closed by a governmental order, the employer is able to continue operations comparable to its previous operations. And so the employer's operations are not considered to have been fully or partially suspended. As a result, the answer is no under that provision, but they could be considered for the ERC if they have a significant decline in gross receipts. What about a restaurant that is still doing drive through or takeout, but the dining room is closed? Any of you have those clients like me? Well, the answer to this is an employee's workplace is closed by a government order for certain purposes, but not everything, right? We're remaining open for other purposes. However, the employer's operations would be considered to be partially suspended and thus eligible for the employee retention credit also be eligible if we have a significant decline in gross receipts. So in this case, could be eligible under both provisions potentially. What about a business with multiple locations? Suppose a business has five locations. Four re can remain open, but one is closed by a government order. We'll go back to the restaurant example, right? I have five locations across different localities uh, across the region. Is this business eligible? The answer is all members of an aggregated group are treated as a single employer for the purposes of the ERC. So having said that, is this a yes or a no? Are they eligible? The answer is yes, they are. They would be considered partially suspended and thus eligible for the ERC. What about an employer who is subject to a governmental order to fully or partially suspend its business operations and then the order is subsequently listed, is the employer considered to have business operations that were suspended? The answer is yes, but only for the periods during the calendar quarters in which the trader business were fully or partially suspended. The order was effective for a portion of the calendar quarter, then the employer is an eligible employer for the entire quarter. However, you only claim wages during the period that the order is enforced. So I've seen some confusion on this. You don't get to claim wages for the entire quarter if it was under this part of the provision if, if you weren't closed or substantially or partially closed because of a result of the order, right? However... The other provision, the significant decline in gross receipts, is a different calculation. So there may be cases in which you qualify both ways and you choose to use the significant decline in gross receipts option so that you can count the entire quarter. Just a planning strategy for you there. What about an employer that acquires a trade or business during the 2020 calendar year? Did they have how do we determine if they had a significant decline in gross receipts? So this ERC is different because you can have a business that starts during 2020 
it this does not have the same provisions of you had to be open prior to 2020 or you had to be open on February 15. We don't have those provisions in the ERC. So for the purposes of the ERC here, we're going to determine whether the employer has a significant decline in gross receipts. And the way we're going to do that is we're going to look back at the previous business. So even in an asset sale where the company itself did not transfer, this is very unusual, but even in an asset sale, we're going to still look back at the revenue that was produced by that asset under the old company to get a comparison and see if there is a significant decline for the purposes of the ERC. So that's kind of unlike what we usually do. That's a safe harbor approach uh, that has been issued on that. And so we're going to use the gross receipts regardless of the fact that the employer did not even own the acquired asset or business during that 2019 calendar quarter. What about an eligible employer that paid wages in the first quarter of 20, or how does an eligible report those wages? So the reason we're asking this question is the 941 for the first quarter did not have set up for this. And we got a very interesting answer here. And the answer is that you're supposed to report those wages on the second quarter. <sighs> how many of us included those wages on quarter one, but just didn't include the credit? It's an interesting FAQ answer here. Um, and frankly, it surprised me. I thought we were going to have the credit that we needed to account for on quarter two, but the way this is worded seems to imply that we should have included the wages altogether in quarter two. Very surprising to me, and I think we need a clarification on that, or I'm hoping I misread it. If not, we're going to have a whole bunch of amended first quarter 941s, I think, and that's kind of a mess. So, Interesting. Uh, curious if any of you have any other insights on that, let me know. But uh, I thought that FAQ was quite interesting. Another question. Can an eligible employer that receives the PPP loan receive the ERC? Boy, has this one been a popular question. And the answer to this is no. An employer may not receive the ERC if they receive a PPP. If they receive the ERC, if they receive the PPP, regardless of the date of the loan, the ERC cannot be claimed. So several of us knew that we wouldn't be able to double dip here, but thought that we might be able to use the ERC up until the date of the first disbursement. And we're not. In fact, there it even talks about a credit recapture uh, in the cases where that happened. So short answer is we cannot use the ERC at all if a PPP loan is granted, either before or during or after the PPP period, it cannot be used at all if you receive a PPP loan. So uh, that's the answer there. Next question we have, may employees receive both the paid family and medical leave and the ERC? Give me what you think the answer to that is in the chat. And meanwhile, we're going to go ahead and launch our next polling question while we throw that one up. And this polling question, the maximum ERC per employee, is it 10,000 total, 5,000 total, 10,000 per eligible quarter, or 5,000 per eligible quarter? What is the correct answer? Vaughn, what do we have in the Q&A stack? I'm on the microphone. All right, let's take a look at what our most upvoted one we have right now. Ooh, a lot of collection stuff. Uh, let's go below that. We'll come back to the collection here at the end. Let's focus on this. Can the owner of an S-Port, S-Corp give themselves a raise to meet the 75% payroll threshold? That's a great question. Uh, and the short answer is they definitely cannot give themselves a raise above the pro rata 100,000, right? So let me say that from the outset. That part's 100% clear. You mm -hmm. cannot pay anyone above the 100,000 uh, and, and use that. Bottom line. Can you give an employee a raise? It's interesting because Vaughn and I were actually talking about this before we started the webinar today. You tell my face. And he and I have a different opinion. Mm -hmm. um, so split vote, and we don't have the forgiveness guidance on this. My opinion is it is within the intent of the law to do that. 
Uh, and so the answer to that would be, in my opinion, that you you probably could. However, I don't think I would for a sole, you know, for, for the S Corp owner. Um, I think you can give other employees that are unrelated to you hmm. a raise. I do not think you can give family members a raise. I do not think you can give an owner a raise uh, and probably not a manager, frankly. So, uh, yep. By the way, we have met our requirement in terms of time. And if you have answered the polling question that is open now and you have answered them all, then you have answered eight polling questions, which is what is required. That poll is now closed. We're going to launch the next two in pretty close succession uh, as we ask some questions here. So just be aware we're going to have a few in a row. And uh, I am going to still talk about um, NOLs or net operating losses briefly. So that's still coming. And we're going to go through some more questions here on the ERC as well. But, well, let me actually dive into the answer for this one that we just asked. So I saw a whole bunch of no's and I saw some maybes and I saw a few yeses. The answer on this one is actually yes. Employers can receive both the paid family medical leave credit and the ERC, but not for the same wage payment. So you can't double dip. However, you can receive this uh, before or after in the case of the FFCRA stuff. Uh, let's go through an example real quick just to help people understand this. So we have company A who has two full-time employees, each at four grand a month and three part-time employees. The average monthly payroll runs at 10 grand. We're going to assume that they are impacted and that revenue is down by at least 50% in both quarter two and three and back to 80% in quarter four. What are the options that could help? Well, the first option, of course, is the EIDL grant. The second option is the EIDL loan. The third option is the PPP. The fourth option is the ERC. And the fifth option is the delay of payment of employer payroll taxes. So let's look at the PPP. It's going to be two and a half times average monthly payroll. Average monthly payroll is 10 grand. So we're looking at $25,000 loan, at least 20 of which could be forgiven. We're going to assume there's some utilities, some rent, some mortgage interest probably in there. Does it meet the other five grand or not? We don't know yet, right? The next part of the equation to look at is the ERC. So in this case, we're going to take 5,000 times two. How do I get to 5,000? Well, we know that we have two quarters worth of payroll that are included here, and we have two full time employees at four grand a month. So that's six months times four grand, that exceeds the 10 grand. So we're going to take 50% of the 10 grand, which is five grand. That's our maximum credit for those two employees, which, by the way, was the answer to that polling question, right? Five grand in total for that and for those employees. We're going to multiply that times the two employees. And then we're going to add to that 10 grand the 2,000 that remains, because 10 minus eight means that there's 2,000 split between the other three employees. We're going to multiply that by the six months, and then we're going to divide that by two. And the answer there would be 16 grand. So that would be kind of the way that the ERC uh, works there. We're going to talk briefly about modifications for NOLs. There are special rules for losses arising in 18, 19, and 20. You can have an NOL carry back to each of the five taxable years that precede the taxable year of loss. That means we could go all the way back to 2013. We could carry back 100%. And there are some special rules that I'm not going to get into. But bottom line is the IRS is going to accept these eligible refund claims on Form 1139 or Form 1045, and there are fax numbers set up specifically for this purpose. Do not use these fax numbers for any other purpose. They'll be ignored, whatever you send. They're only being used for these purposes. By the way, they'll accept up to 100 pages. If you have supporting documentation over 100 pages, you have a mess. So uh, just FYI, I wanted to put that in your material that those are there. And by the way, uh, normally we cannot do section 965 stuff on the 1139 and 1045. We can only for CARES Act purposes. The instructions for the 1139 and 1045 specify that you cannot use those forms if it includes section 965. But for CARES Act purposes, you can. So I wanted to let everybody know that. And uh, in terms of how we are going to handle these, you're going to include at the top of 1139 the statement 
that you are electing to take 100% refundable credit amount. I've given you that statement to put at the top, and then I've given you this information here. And then for the 8827, I've given you the statement that you need to make there. Again, I don't have time to go over too much of this, uh, but notice 2020-26 relates to this and gives us a six-month extension for these. This is important because for taxpayers with an NOL that began in calendar year 2018 and ended on or before 6.30 of 19, these are going to be eligible. So an extension is solely for requesting the tentative refunds, not an extension on the return. It is solely for requesting the tentative refund to carry back the NOL, and it must be filed by June 30. This means that any of these that you think have an NOL, you need to be dealing with before July 15. You need to be dealing with by June 30. And I've seen some, in my opinion, bad teaching out there saying you have December 30 because that it's a little confusing. It, you do get December 30 for the minimum tax, but you need to file these together. So what you really need to pay attention to is the 630 of 2020. The IRS wants these filed together. So pay attention to the June 30 date. That is what you need to pay attention to. And on the top of the form, you're going to put the statement that I have given you there. So uh, background on this, for those that don't know, these would have normally been due December 31st of 2019. So uh, as a heads up there, I want to once again plug our virtual spring seminar. Uh, it's going to be June 3rd through 5th, 12 hours of IRSCE. It'll be uh, virtual, so it'll be by live webinar, 200 bucks for members of Visa or NA, N, NAEA, 250 bucks for non-members, very affordable per CE hour. And you can see uh, what the courses are there, pretty good courses on Wednesday, Thursday, and Friday. And some of the top speakers in the country will be with us for that. You can register for that at visa.org slash tax seminars. And with that, we're going to go ahead and launch our next polling question. And this is forms 1139 and 1045 can now be faxed true or false. And Vaughn, what's our next question? All right. Business is monthly payroll expecting to receive the PPP in the second wave. If they run now, will they include this payroll in their PPP forgiveness calculation? Or should they wait until the PPP is secured? I'm not sure I understand the question. I, I think where they're going with this one is you've qualified for it. Maybe you haven't signed the documents yet, but you know it's coming. Can I can I pay it ahead? And I, I still think you're better off waiting for your eight week period to start, which is, and this is, we saw a bunch of questions on this. The eight week period begins when the funding hits your account. It's not the signature date on the loan document. It's not your application date. It's not any other date. It is when the fund, the day the funds hit the account, start counting your eight weeks. And, and to clarify, what the guidance actually says is the date of the first disbursement. There are some lenders who are rolling the disbursement out in waves instead of a total disbursement at once. Most lenders are giving the total loan at once, but there are some lenders who are breaking that into multiple disbursements. And it is the date of the first disbursement begins the eight week period. Thanks for that clarification because most of my clients are, I think are getting it all at one time. I have not seen it broken up, but I, I can see why on some of the larger loans it would be. Yep. Um, let's see what else. Yes. By the way, we're going to close this polling question in five seconds, and we're going to launch the next one right behind it. So don't let that surprise anyone. A bunch of questions on sole proprietors, independent contractors, uh, accounting for their expenses, and so on. I know we're waiting for guidance on this, but any you want to throw any thoughts out on the PPP? And yeah, I'm not. I'm not. Uh, yeah, we, the forgiveness part we don't have. So we do have how we're going to do the first part, and we have hints at the forgiveness part. Right. Um, but we don't have the total the total guidance, and so I'm really hesitant to tell you definitively what it's going to be. Yeah, I think it, especially we have more intuition on the on the what we think are the things you'll need when you when the bank reviews you if you are a business with employees, but the self employed independent contractor side. We're all waiting for guidance on that. Yeah, I mean, you know, obviously we're using the Schedule C. Everyone knows when we're applying for the loan. That's how we're qualifying. Um, having said that, there are some questions about how we're going to get the forgiveness. Is it going to be the same Schedule C and so it's automatic? I've seen some people suggest that. 
Uh, I have seen other people suggest that we're going to provide bank statements and it's going to be what we actually spent during that period. Um, and, you know, I cannot answer that definitively one way or another at this point. Last question. This webinar has been super helpful, moderately helpful. The answer to the last question was true. You could fax those forms. Uh, question, would 2019 employer match to pension plan accrued be considered qualifying payroll costs for the PPP or only amounts incurred during the eight-week period? Only amounts you spend. So it's what you actually spend. So you have to, there's, I don't want to get into bank tracing rules too much here, but, right. you know, that's kind of beyond our scope. But the bottom line is you've got to be able to trace the expense. <laughs> And so, but I think if you've accrued the expense on the pension and pay it in the eight week period, you cover it. Yeah. You need to pay it. That's what I'm saying. The expense needs to, you need to have paid the expense. And, and so another question we have, by the way, is can you prepay things? So for example, I have a question of, can I prepay utilities? I've had people ask me that, you know, all right, I, I've got this extra amount, right? I'm getting 10 weeks worth of payroll. I've only got eight weeks worth of payroll. I don't have a mortgage. I don't have a rent. I own my building. Can I prepay some utilities? I've been asked that by several churches. And guess what my answer is? I don't know. Yeah, I'm leaning towards no as a safety, but no one knows. That well, has I mean, the short answer is, I don't think, and in that case, I say try it. Because the, the worst case scenario is you only get credit for what you would have if you didn't try it. Well, you, you use the funds you would have spent on the future utilities to pay the loan back. The problem with that, though, is how some banks are setting up these loan agreements. And I've, I've seen six different agreements from six different banks so far. Only one bank in our area set up interest only payments from month one through month 17. This is assuming the six month deferral, by the way. Interest only from month one through 17 with a balloon, which gave someone flexibility to spread their payments out. All the others have spread the whole loan over 18 months. So in that case, you still have to make your full one month payment. And maybe it would take two months of payments, but you don't have the ability to spread that small balance over the 18 months. If the loan agreement says, I want my full one eighteenth of your balance paid on that first month. And that could be a big payment for some people. Yeah, depending on the size of the loan. But you know, in, yeah. in theory, the payroll portion would have been forgiven by then because that has to be forgiven within 60 oh, days. No, clearly you would know, right? Yeah. But I mean, if you still have some that's not been forgiven, so let's say on a $30,000 loan, you've gotten 24 of it forgiven, you're left with six. That payment, those first two payments, you'll full pay the loan back and it won't matter you had 18 months based on right. the way the loan was designed. So what I'm really hoping is that before we end the eight-week period, we're going to have this guidance. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yeah, we should have had it this week, right? And we should, right? I mean, they we were led to believe I would have it on Monday. So, yeah. Yeah. And that's what I was thinking. I had heard as well. So um, what if the, we're going to mix in EIDL again? All right. The EIDL grant was received after a PPP loan. The grant was applied for prior to the PPP, but not received till after. Um, it was assumed it would not be received and not included because the PPP calculation and application form uh, I will say the 10, I think we're talking about up to the $10,000 grant. So again, on this. So does anything need to be done with this when you're dealing with the grant and the PPP? Because it does, I will say, impact forgiveness. Um, the intent of the form seemed like they would reduce your PPP loan by the amount of the grant you receive, but it all happened so quick. I know people are getting their grant and the full amount of their loan. So there will be a reconciliation on forgiveness, um, but not... Yeah. I mean, we, you know, yeah. You just got to plan for that. It wasn't the, I think they tried to switch at the last minute, but they couldn't switch. They couldn't do it all. Yeah. I mean, the short, the short answer is that, you know, it's clear that, that the, the portion that was a grant of the EIDL, which is not necessarily 10 grand, right? We all know now that that yeah. was a thousand per employee. Whatever that was is reduced automatically from your forgiveness amount on the PPP. Yeah, correct. So you'll have to make that in your first initial payments back to the amount of your monthly payment. We've got a few questions on this form 7200. You ready? We're going to switch you up. Okay. 
Uh, on Form 7200, if you don't pay sick leave or family emergency leave, can they still get the ERC, the employer retention credit? All right, ask me the question again. I was reading another, sorry. That's right. On Form 7200, if you don't pay sick leave and you don't pay family emergency leave, can they still get the ERC, the employer retention credit? Yes, you can. So it can be used for the ERC. It can be used for paid sick leave. It can be used for the expanded family medical leave. It can be used for any combination of the above or just one of those. And I think you hit this, but can you take the credit? Well, I know you did. Can you take the credit for periods prior to obtaining the PPP and then after the eight weeks, if still applicable? Can you, you can't mix the two. I mean, PPP is either or or. I'm sorry, or it's not either. It's not together. Excuse me. I've said that poorly. Yeah, correct. Yeah, yeah. If, you, if you get the PPP, you cannot claim the ERC. And in fact, if you claim the ERC before you got the PPP, there's a there's a recapture. Oh, great point. Uh, someone's saying and talking about having to continue to make regular payroll tax deposits and then claim the credit. But I think there's an exception for that, right? Sorry, I was reading. So I got to quit reading. Go ahead. Ask again. Uh, at, someone's mentioning that their client is continuing to make regular payroll tax deposits, but then they'll claim the credit later. I think the implant. Well, go ahead. So I, you read the answer. Sorry. What what they are intending for you to do is to reduce your payroll tax deposits now. Correct. That's what they're intending for you to do. You can take the credit on the nine forty one, but what they are intending for you to do is to reduce the payroll tax deposits. You cannot use the seventy two hundred for after the fact, Got so it. that. The 7,200 is for advanced, okay? So it's, you know, it's not for, hey, I didn't bother to reduce, so now I'm going to claim it. It is you need to reduce your payroll tax deposits along the way or you wait for the 941. Got it. We're going to bring us back apparently into a bunch of uh, distribution dates on the PPP, eight weeks. So clarification, eight weeks from first distribution. They're asking, does does it, is there a distinguish between the borrower taking a distribution or the lender disbursement? I believe it's lender, but go ahead. I'm guessing for you and having you correct me. So It's going to be the same date in most cases. I would think so, right? So borrower taking right. distribution should be the same date as the lender disbursement. I was trying to think of a situation. Yeah. So the answer, the answer is it's going to be borrower, but yeah. it's going to be the same date. Christy, you can shoot another note out if I if I miss if I didn't interpret that question correctly. Um, so a couple of people are saying, "Hey, you're over." This is this is free Q and A at the end. You're welcome to go, as I said, you know, 20 minutes ago. So you're welcome to go if you want to. This is just completely free Q and A. If you want to stick around for the Q and A, you're welcome. Can I, and this is what you hit on, and I think you and I are potentially on different sides of the fence on this. Can the eight-week period contain payroll that was for April hours before the loan was received? I'm not quite as sold as you are on that. I know you're more comfortable than I am right now before guidance, but I'm edging towards no. You're more than edging towards yes. Uh, yeah, I mean, the intent is clearly that it's whatever was paid within the eight-week period. Mm -hmm. if, if you're waiting, you know, if you are waiting until the hours are worked, then you're not going to get eight full weeks of payroll. Well, so what we've seen is I've seen some write-ups that have tried to argue both sides of this. And one of them said, look, I get my disbursement, let's call it today, April 30. Now, I my payroll, I typically pay from, you know, last week's work is paid in this week. So since the work was not done in the eight-week period, does the check I cut this week after April 30 count? Yeah, it's it's the, the law, it, the, the act itself is clear that it's what was paid within the eight-week period. Right. So then can you accelerate a payment at the end of it so I can finish and get to my disbursements and maybe do another partial payroll my second to last day because my payroll period would might have fallen uh, after that eight week deadline. So this is very similar to the can I prepay utility question, right? And the answer is we need some guidance on that. So this also goes back to can I pay for payroll that is delinquent? <laughs> so. I'm very confident saying that you can run your normal course of pattern. I normally pay every two weeks. I, you know, I'm scheduled to pay tomorrow for what I pay, what 
people worked last week, which is true, by the way. I am scheduled to pay tomorrow for what people worked last week. So that's my normal pattern, right? There's always a week between when people actually complete the pay period and when payroll gets cut. That's normal, perfectly normal for a business, right? And so if I'm continuing my normal pattern, it's whatever I spent during the eight-week period. I'm very confident in that. The Love question that. becomes... We're getting lots ahead. of what saying? period. So I really want to just you know give us a chance to hit that before we move on because that's yep. that's tripping a lot of people up. The eight uh, week period starts. Well, part of what's tripping people up is the ASCPA gave bad guidance. But the I will I, say I'll, that I'll name I, it. I've seen some of the commentary. I think they thought the intent of the ASCPA was for issuing recommendations to SBA. Um as what they would like to be seen done. But I think a lot of people are also interpreting that document as a direct recommendation to a member. And, and I think that's where you're getting at, right? Yeah. So, and I absolutely agree. I wish the SBA let us pick the period. I'm hundred oh, percent in favor of that, idea, but, but they haven't in their guidance. Right. All right. Let me, uh, let's see here. Would, I don't do a lot of farmers, uh, so I, I think you uh, run across somewhere in your practice. Would not a farmer be disqualified? I don't do farm returns at all. Schedule F is foreign. All go right. We'll just, we're, we're not going to go into that one because neither one of us uh, do enough of that to, to guess. Um, we covered that. For the ERC, what about a self-employed individual with employees? The answer to that is Basically, if they are on payroll and you're filing 941s, then you're probably okay. Um, but you cannot include the owner or any family members. I'm, I think I understand this question, but I'll throw it out there. <clears throat> For 501c3, 501c organization, excuse me. Are they able to use the reduction of income method or only partial full closure? Yeah, you're able to use the reduction in income method. Absolutely. All right, cover that. All right. If, if an employer was closed under a stay-at-home order and telework was not an option, the employee should just take unemployment for that time frame. FFCRA paid leave does not apply because there was no work for the employer to provide for the employee. Is that correct? Yeah, that's correct. In that case, they're heading to unemployment. And, and just a note on unemployment, because I've gotten a bunch of questions from clients that on the whole, you know, hey, I've got my PPP funds and I have client, I have my employees who are on unemployment. I'm ready for them to come back, but they don't want to come back because they're earning money more on unemployment than they can earn from me. And asking me as a tax professional for advice on that. And I just let them know, I think we're getting to legal liability and labor law questions that is not tax professional based. So thoughts on that? I, I talked to a couple of attorneys who agreed that's not a question we should be answering. So I wasn't comfortable advising them how they would handle their state unemployment situation. Uh, I recognize the problem 100%, but Yep. Yeah, I, I agree with you that that bumps into labor law. I have my strong opinions and feel I'm accurate, but I'll 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 keep them out. Someone asked me to repeat what I said, but I'm not sure what they said that after. So if you can let me know what it was about, I could maybe repeat it. Um, Someone else sure. asked, and I, I'm not supposed to answer these out of the chat, but I will in this particular case because it's in my area. If the pastor is the only employee of the church, can they get any benefit? The answer to that is yes. Okay. Can an employer, uh, I'm sorry, this gentleman, uh, I'm sorry, someone's asking if their client wants to use PPP loan funds to pay employees bonuses. And, and I, I would strongly advise against that. I'm not confident that that will hold up uh, unless it is your pattern that you normally do that. So if you can show a pattern that you normally do that and that those bonuses are merit-based or whatever the case may be, you're following the pattern of what you've always done, then I think you're going to be fine. If you're simply trying to get around the forgiveness piece, I'm not sure you're going to be okay. 
I think there's a little more uh, detail we're going to have to share on this question, but the, the question is, can an employer pay 10 days sick leave, then family leave, up to the time the PPP funds are received? Okay, so they did clarify that. I don't yes. think there's an issue with that. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. I, I thought they were implying they could pick their PPP eight-week period to coincide with that, but they're not. They're, they're clearly saying, hey, I've, I've paid sick leave, and by the time everything processed through, uh, and yes, yeah, so Penny, that's a great question, and uh, I would agree with that as well. Um, what happens if an employee is terminated after you received the PPP funds? Is this a situation should, where you should return a portion of the PPP? I think we need guidance on this one. Well, no, we don't really. I mean, the short answer is... Seventh? Yeah, the short answer is you might replace that employee, and that's okay, which gets back to a well, question. I, I don't know if anybody agrees with you on that one. I, I've heard some people who would disagree on that one. Well, they may, but the law is pretty clear. Mm -hmm. Um Actually, the, the law itself, the text of the law itself specifically spells that out, that you can yeah, replace yeah. an employee. That's my bad, but I missed that. Yep. Um, so, yeah, you can totally replace an employee and be perfectly fine. Okay. So let me say that, first of all. Um, the second piece that I would say is that if you have an, an individual, I totally forgot the question. What was the question? Sorry, I got sidetracked. Uh, you're terminating somebody after you got your funds. Yeah. So remember that you cannot have more than a 75% reduction in payroll. So you can reduce payroll. You just can't have more than a 75% reduction in payroll. Now, will that impact forgiveness? Quite likely. Uh, but you can always return those funds. Now, I will tell you that I've seen some banks that are really weird about the returned funds, but they are supposed to take them back. I saw a couple of questions pop up about, uh, I know you had commented earlier about family members and increasing pay, but I think there's, they're asking for a little clarification if it's a family owned business and all the employees are family. So in that scenario that preexisted, but we're not giving any of those people raises or bonuses. Yeah. I, I think you're, you're better to stay in your lane. You need to, you're going to be compared to, I think January and mid February and what you were doing to date. And in what you're paying out, is that in line? I think you get out of that. That, I mean, we well, let's clarify this as I say that. No guidance still on, from the SBA. And in the end, it's the bank who's going to be auditing this. And you need to know. So I'm telling my clients, I want you to go back to your bank. And I want you to ensure you get the bank's documented guidance. Because we've already seen loan agreements change and not be the same. So clearly, I think there's going to be some variation in the guidance per bank. And I really would like to know from each individual bank how they do that. So I'm cutting myself off saying without those two things, we're, there is an educated guess element to this. Yeah, let me let me clarify something. A couple of people have said in the chat that I said something backwards and, and maybe I did. I wasn't listening to myself necessarily, but you have to maintain 75% on your payroll. So you can have a reduction down to that 75%, but not beyond that 75%. So if I said that wrong before, that's what I meant. Okay. Uh, let's see. So someone's asking a question related to um, what you and I decided to avoid. That last question that came up last night on from the SBA. Oh, and okay. Go ahead. <laughs> <laughs> so we will, since it's being asked. Um, so the SBA, well, let me give some background here. There's some congressional and media, and particularly media, uproar about some of these public companies that have taken big loans for the PPP that fit in the, you know, the 72 uh, in a ICS code range, meaning they're hospitality based restaurants, that sort of thing. Um, and so the question becomes, what was the SBA going to do about that? And so the SBA came back and clarified, there's a question that you're answering on the app the PPP app, which there is and has been all along. There's a question that you're answering. Is this a necessary loan? Uh, and Vaughn, if you could pull up that application and get that exact verbiage for me, I don't remember the exact verbiage, but basically what it's saying is, are there finance, you know, is there economic uncertainty enough in your business that, that this is a necessary loan for you? Now there's, I don't have that wording right, but that's the essential crux of it. Vaughn's going to look it up for me. Yeah. And you have to attest whoever is signing on behalf of the organization, 
on behalf of the company has to attest that the answer to that is yes. And so what the SBA has come back and said is that if you have, you know, if you're a public company, that sort of thing, you probably have other options. However, normal SBA guidance for these says that you cannot have any other financing option. And that is not true for this particular loan. Uh, in fact, that was pretty clear in the CARES Act that, that that does not have to be true for this particular loan. But you do have to be able to test to that particular piece. And so what we don't know yet is will we have to prove that we did have economic hardship in order to qualify for the loan? And what the SBA has said is you could have to prove that. Do you want uh, to do you want me to clarify that I found the application? I think Yeah, go for it. Read it. Current economic uncertainty makes this loan request necessary to support the ongoing operations of the applicant. Is that it? Yep. Yep. So that's the question. And and you know, like I said, I got the crux of it, but I didn't remember the exact verbiage and I wanted to give the verbiage. So uh, thanks for looking that up, Vaughn. So, you know, basically what the SBA is saying is if you perjured yourself and you answered that wrong, you in trouble. And you and you need to to pay the funds back before it's either May 6, May 7, I don't remember, but within the next week. Uh, so that has got some people thinking, oh my gosh, what if, you know, a lot of people took these loans because there was economic uncertainty they felt they could say, and they didn't know what was going to happen, especially the people that sort of applied early on, right? So what, it, you know, are we going to be in trouble? And the short answer is until we see those forgiveness guidelines, we don't know. But what the SBA has said here is they could request that information. What if the guidance comes after May 7th? I totally think that's a possibility. Uh, someone else put a comment here that they heard yesterday. It's going to be May 15th before we get that guidance. So I had not heard that, but, um, you know, now, if, if you've been using it, so here's a way to potentially cover your bases. Let's say um, you applied for it. You're going to use it. You have it. Uh, things have been better than you thought. So you're paying payroll with these funds, but you're also maybe escrow in the same amount you would have used in the first place. And after May 7th, uh, if you decide, you know what, I, I'm still doing fine. I can pay this back. And you've paid the whole principal and the interest back. Again, we're speculating, but I I suspect that's going to be addressing the issue as well, but I, that wouldn't be till after May 7th. And I was just responding to that comment. Yeah. I mean, so my gut, but again, this is gut, mm -hmm. which is only worth so much. So let me say that from the start. My gut is that when we're dealing with smaller loans, they're not going to look at this. My gut, because this is really in response to the uproar that the media has had on these big loans. And 2 million plus is what, Treasury Secretary Mnuchin has already verbally said, but we're waiting for guidance of if that number is going to be lower or not and so on. I think if you have clients that are in these larger loan amounts, mm -hmm. then you need to be more concerned about this question. And what are you saying is larger? And, he, and your, what's your gut number on that? My not gut is that 2 million. You know, yeah. yeah. And, and I do have clients in that category, by the way. Um, but, you know, that, and, and by the way, you can be in that category and be under the 500 employees. Sure, yeah. Yeah, so we're not even talking about just the ones that are above 500. I have other colleagues that think it's going to be only the ones that are above 500 and we're in that 72 in a ICS code range and that they're going to need to prove um, if you were over the 500. So I can't tell you for sure what it is. My feeling, my gut is that if you're under that 2 million, you're probably okay and they're not going to call on this. Having said that, some of this depends on the continued uproar in the media between now and when the guidance comes out. Well, it's I, I've been joking in some uh, emails that I've been doing uh, email blasts. Interim final rule just contradicts itself across the way, which means you can update your interim final rule anytime you want to, and that's part of the challenge now. That you know, early on, I was all for encouraging clients to do PPP. If I knew as much as I knew today, I'm not sure I wouldn't have pushed more of the ERC than the PPP for certain people. So I think I shared in a previous webinar, probably the last one we did, um, you know, I did not choose to do PPP for my business, for my tax business. Um, and, 
you know, I just didn't. Now I did do the little EIDL grant. I have two employees. So that was two grand. So I did do that. Uh, but I did not do the PPP. And for me, it was that question that stopped me from doing it. I cannot really say that, that I'm not going to survive <laughs> without the PPP funds. So, um, well, you know, they survive, right? So, I mean, for, let's say in your practice, uh, I know some of the tax practitioners out there have lost some clients along the way. Sure. And early on, they're like, how many more am I going to keep losing? And then is that going to help me, is it affect me making payroll? For many tax professionals, we're, we're billing now and we're having funds later to pay payroll later in the year. Well, right. So, you know, what was normally a seasonal thing where you received this income by April 15 now became much of that income in that last month, which is a serious month for many of our tax offices, is extended now all the way and spread out through July. Right. Uh, and so that is a serious impact. And and I have friends that, you know, had to lay off their staff uh, if it weren't for the PPP. And in that scenario, you can totally justify getting the PPP. For me, in my little bitty practice that I that I have, where I have myself and one other person, I mean, I have a very small practice, and my income is actually up this year. Why? Because, you know, last year I was full-time working for Happy Tax, right? This year, I'm not. So my income is actually up, significantly so. I'm at like 500% of last year. How can I justify when I'm at 500% of last year taking those funds, right? I, I really couldn't. Well, now, I did take this year. Do what? They picked up a couple of new clients, but they also lost clients because of this. So they may be lucky to be in the same figures as last year. With right. that and, that? and again, I think if you have economic uncertainty, and especially if you had decline, I think you're perfectly fine. Now, some of you know, I also pastor a church. My church did take it. Because those first couple of weeks we were out, our giving dropped through the floor. Yeah. Now we're going to be okay, and we know that now. But when we made that application, our giving had dropped through the floor. Um, and and so we did have uncertainty at the time we answered that question. And we did apply as a church, and we received it, and we're using it. I'm and I'm that. confident that at the moment we answered the question, we can say we had economic uncertainty. I look clearly, but now, now almost a month later after making the application, if May seventh is the date, like I can't even pay it all back after the seventh in that scenario. If May seventh the date, do I have a week to decide if I feel differently, or can I still use it and then make sure I pay all the principal and interest back and nobody cares? I we don't I, know. personally, I think you're fine, and I think you're fine to go for the forgiveness because you were fine. you applied based on the guidance that had been given at that time. There's no retroactive thing going on here. Um, and you're under the $2 million. So we've dropped down to four hundred as we have these conversations. I hope people are finding this interesting because I know a lot of tax professionals that email me questions. I have clients asking questions. And you and I can debate all day. We're at 440. We've been two hours and 40 minutes. Do we want to just uh, are we wrapping things up, people? Or are we hitting a couple more questions? Knox, how are you feeling? Uh, I'm okay with a couple more, but I haven't looked at the Q&A at all. Do we have any with serious amounts of up, up votes here? Uh, no, most is just me, to be honest. Okay, I cool. Voting. A couple of them did early on. Most of these are ones I moved up, and I think we've hit on a lot of this, or they're very... So is there anything else you want to hit on based on what you're seeing in chat or as we wrap up, and I'll scan and see if there's any of the new ones that we might want to cover? Yeah, so I think we answered this. I'm just going to answer a couple here. You can combine the FFCRA and the PPP, but you cannot double dip. And so if you're getting the FFCRA credits, then those amounts cannot be used for forgiveness in the PPP. I think we alluded to that, but I just wanted to clarify that because that was one of the questions that, that was there. Um, so I wanted to do that. The, the other question that sort of came in here, um, let's see if the PPP loan is received on a Thursday, does the eight week period end on the next Thursday or the, or a Wednesday, eight weeks from now? Uh, and I would say on, on the Wednesday. So you get a full eight week period there. So that was a good question. Um, couple of people are, and I haven't marked these as answered by the way, but I guess that's okay. Um, couple of people are saying, are expenses paid with PPP funds not deductible? My answer to that is if they are forgiven, 
in the same year as the expense, they would not be deductible. Uh, and that goes with current, current law, basically, and guidance. Um, the Another question that we have here, um, that reporting that they have some clients who have received stimulus money, even though they were reported as dependents. I have clients in that scenario too. It is not right. However, they got lucky. Um, that's the <laughs> short answer. There has been some verbal, let's say some verbiage from some politicians in the last couple of days without getting to who, saying that if that happened, they, they commented on they expect that money to be returned, but I'm not aware that's written into any of the, the CARES Act or any of the laws that go with that. Are you? Yeah, that's correct. The IRS has opened up a way to return it, um, but I don't think they can compel it. Now, they are pulling back. The IRS is initiating the pullback for deceased persons. Good. Yeah, there were some questions about, you know, hey, I got a deposit for someone who's deceased or, you know, whatever. Um, so, okay, that's good to know because I hadn't seen that. Yep. So, per, for and we have a question here. Uh, more on the stimulus payment. I have a client concerned that they received a payment for their deceased payment. That does need to be returned. So a deceased payment does need to be returned. We just got that out yesterday, day before, sometime this week um, that the IRS released that. But on dependents, I, I, I think they got lucky is my answer. Right. Um, other people are saying, hey, I applied for the EIDL grant, but never heard back other than the confirmation number. Yeah, when you're going to hear back, you're going to only hear it in two ways. You're going to hear it because you have notification that your credit got pulled because you have monitoring on your credit reports, or you're going to see money got deposited in your bank account. There's, <laughs> there's no other communication uh, when it, in, in my experience. Now, later on, you may get offered an EIDL loan, the actual loan part, uh, and there is communication on that. But in terms of the actual grant money, it, I can speak in my case and in the case of a lot of colleagues, I noticed a credit pull because I got monitoring two, three days, business days later, it was in my account. Just as in, we're talking about EIDL, I was shared this today. Now, this is third party, but uh, someone who did speak with someone at the SBA and they said yesterday that the SBA is currently four weeks behind processing EIDL applications. So as of yesterday, they were, uh, which was April 29th, they were already were only working on March 25th applications. Um, and the 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 grant of a thousand per employee up to ten is also running still ten or fifteen days behind. So just as a to share that, if you're waiting and so on, just thought I'd pass that on. It's not something I spoke to, but was shared with me. By the way, someone asked, what is my source on saying that the EIDL grant reduces the amount of the PPP loan? It's in the CARES Act itself. It's in the CARES Act, yep. Yep. Right from the beginning, that's always been stated. Yep. Um, someone else is saying, are they still processing EIDL loans? The answer to that is yes. That's a different question. Than, there's a different question than could you put in a new application today and get it approved because they're out of money? <laughs> I, I don't think any new applicant, they don't have enough money to process the current application. So that I would think the answer is no. Yeah, I, I agree with that, but they are still processing them. So I'm not, you know, you may have asked when you said, are they still processing them? Can I still put one in? Or you may have asked, are they still processing them? So I was, we were kind of answering that both ways. So Ed out there, I was asking his tax office is less 20% income for this time of the year. So it's curious because are you down because uh, you've lost clients? Are you down because people aren't rushed in with their stuff because they had to July 15th? Or, you know, how are they going to measure this reduction is it, you know, you, don't have, you really won't know to the end of the year, potentially, how you're going to compare to last year. Uh, it's tough. I think hopefully they leave some flexibility and forget in how they review forgiveness, because in that situation, Ed, I think you're you should have asked for PPP. I would have. Yeah. And, and I would go back to what was the question? You had economic uncertainty. And so you could answer that question affirmatively. And I think you're fine. And, and I think it really boils down to at the point when you answered that question, could you legitimately say there was economic uncertainty? Yep. So I use the example of my church, right? Um, we had economic uncertainty at the time we submitted the application. Now we're in better shape today than we were then, but that doesn't change the answer to the question at the date when we answered it. I love this question because it's been some uncertainty about it. So let's just clarify because I don't think we touched on it today. 
can you pay, pay let's just do this what payroll taxes can you pay with ppp money so you can pay the basically it's gross payroll that's included so mm-hmm. that includes the employer i'm sorry the employee share right right but not the employer share and so, so you're going to include gross payroll plus the pro rata share of the health insurance and the retirement benefits mm-hmm. that are on the employer side. Stay so on the employer back. side, you're you're including the health premiums. Mm-hmm. And on the employer side, you're including the retirement contributions. But you are not including the employer side of FICO. State taxes are also included. Correct. So yeah, that there was some confusion early on when this all came out that PPP could not pay the employees withholding and FICA, and that's been clarified since then. So you can play, you can pay the employees share of withholding and the FICA. And someone's asking, can you include SUDA? And the answer to that is yes. Yeah, it's a, you know, it's funny. Great question, Kim, because I was just kind of catching myself, and we're not allowed to pay uh, the the FUDA, is how I'm implying from the employer side of things. But it's interesting. It certainly looks like you can pay SUDA. Uh, it is a little bit of a disconnect there, but great question, Kim. Thank you. Yep. I was and just I agree. In my head. I was like, should I bring this up? <laughs> and and someone else is asking about workers' comp. And no, you cannot include workers' comp. I would agree with that. Um, what else? We're 450. Uh, you're man. I'm just hanging out with you. All right, we're we're gonna close because right, uh, frankly, my throat's getting dry. So <laughs> there you go. I'm I'm out of my tea. Uh, <laughs> that's when we I, end. When I get out I of my tea, up. as they've been picking on me the last couple, I start with this one. I move to this. Yeah, yeah. All right, guys, we want to say thank you. Uh, thank you so much for attending. Obviously, this was a freebie today. Uh, if you enjoyed this, appreciated this, we hope you, you will attend future webinars from the Virginia Association or the Virginia Society of Enrolled Agents. Uh, and obviously on your screen is a link where you can go and register for the spring seminar. And we hope that you will certainly check that out. I will also throw that link, probably should have a long time ago, into the chat uh, just so that you can click on it if you want to do that. Do want to encourage you to answer the survey that will pop up when you exit the webinar today. And beyond that, we just want to say thank you and take care. Bye-bye. Knox, one, if I can sneak in one last thing, there were lots of questions I skipped over just for time on collections. So please be on the lookout. It is our expectation that I, I would like to do some of the collection classes I've done for live audiences as a webinar. And uh, we'll take a lot more questions of that then. So cool. All right. Thank you.